All right, I'm ready now. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> this is the November 24th, 2020 hearing for the Health Committee. I am Council Member Christopher Burnett, Chair of the Committee. Uh, we are also joined this morning by Council President Scott, um, uh, both sponsor of this resolution and uh, President of the City Council, who will give us a few words in a second. Uh, we are joined by Council Member Henry, member of the committee, Council Member Clark, member of the committee, Council Member Reisinger, member of the committee. Um, I see we are also joined by Council Member Cohen, uh, Council Member Slifer, member of the committee. Uh, also in attendance are a number of uh, agency representatives, um, many of which we will hear from today. Um, and we are also staffed by the uh, committee uh, staffer, uh, Marjorie Curran, who will be helping us with all the tech support and whatnot, um, and making sure everything runs smoothly, as always. Uh, before we start, I'm asking all speakers and panelists to mute yourselves when you are not speaking. Uh, identify yourself before you speak, so we have it on the record. Uh, speak slowly and clearly, uh, and after you're finished speaking, please mute yourself again so that we can ensure we can hear everyone after you uh, with no interruptions. Um, also, just a, a, a piece of advice, sometimes people have uh, connection issues. Uh, if needed, some one of the remedies I find to be helpful uh, is maybe turning off the video of everyone else um, on your screen uh, can be helpful sometimes with connection issues. Uh, we are here today uh, to discuss Council Resolution 20-0189R, Informational Hearing Overdose Prevention Sites, uh, for the purpose of inviting representatives from the Health Department, Police Department, Fire Department, Mayor's Office, Criminal Justice, Law Department, and a host of community advocates, agencies, uh, and activists uh, to provide information on overdose prevention sites and how they could be established in Baltimore City. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to President Scott uh, uh, for opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Councilman. Thank you, Chair Burnett. Uh, I call for the, this informational hearing to explore over those prevention sites. And in and, and this context, it's very clear uh, that the way we here in Baltimore have dealt with substance abuse and, and tried to uh, stop uh, overdoses is just not working and has been wrong uh, in many ways. If we have criminalized uh, substance abuse and those who have uh, the, those issues here in our city. I said it uh, many times, but growing up in, in Baltimore and Park Heights, uh, culturally, uh, we were taught uh, implicitly and explicitly to look down on people who use drugs to the point where uh, it really was we were uh, raised to think as them as less than human. We cannot uh, normalize the, the dehumanization of, of drug users. That doesn't help people stay healthy, and it surely doesn't help people uh, stay alive. We know yesterday we hit the 300 homicide mark in Baltimore. And I often uh, stress that these are not just numbers, but people with friends and families and communities who will have to carry on that pain and trauma uh, of that loss for a lifetime. But when you think about overdose uh, and that we're losing at least three times uh, that number to fatal overdoses per year, leaving behind that same pain, that same trauma, but although it's less visible. We have to be serious about our approach as a city and operate in a new and complete and holistic way. Uh, that's why I'm focused on approaching and transforming our approach from one that's often punitive and piecemeal to one that's rooted in the principles of harm reduction uh, for the health and benefit of our entire community. Over those prevention sites can be physical or mobile locations where people can uh, use uh, in a supervised way with safe materials and be referred to a range of services for where they are at on their journey. Uh, in this moment, I often like to have people think about that Baltimore. Uh, uh, way back when uh, Councilman Burnett, you and I were young kids, was at the epicenter where, where uh, Mayor Smoke, we had the first needle exchange program and it was frowned upon and we were, people were thinking that, you know, Mayor Smoke had literally lost his mind because about his views on how to deal with substance abuse and drug and drugs in, in our city and in cities around the country. But we now know that he was 
in the right way. And what struck about me about the cities across the globe uh, uh, where overdose prevention sites are present is that these cities had no overdose deaths. When we talk about evidence-based and community-based approaches to public health and safety, this is one that we have to look at. Uh, this is about making life-saving services accessible uh, and community-driven. Now, I got to be clear that today's hearing is an informational hearing to learn more about the concept and what it is and how it works. We know that uh, establishing overdose prevention sites in Baltimore will likely uh, take state action first. I want to thank uh, Senator Hedelman of Baltimore County for leading uh, on this issue in Annapolis. I look forward to working with her in the upcoming session to continue to fight for a harm reduction approach to how we handle overdose deaths. But we are here today to learn and ask questions. For my part as the mayor-elect and next leader of the city, I want to be clear about what is not optional for me. We will not continue to dehumanize people who use drugs in our community, uh, in our actions or policy. And we will uh, work to establish harm reduction approach across city government. Uh, we have to deal with this issue in a new way. The way that we have been doing it has been broken. It's been tearing communities and families apart. And we know that it's not keeping people alive, which is the basic and most important function of any government. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing uh, the testimony and reports today. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and so just to, uh, want, I want to do a quick overview of how the hearing is going to go. Um, today, we've been working uh, with the uh, representatives from the Bridges Coalition and uh, folks that do a lot of work around harm reduction uh, and felt it was very important to start with uh, individuals who had uh, lived experience um, uh, in this work. Um, and so we are going to start with a panelist of harm reduction experts, and then uh, that will be followed by uh, public agency reports and then public testimony. I uh, just want to lay that out ahead of time uh, and also committee members um, there's in your inbox, you should have received uh, supporting uh, research materials on this topic uh, in your inbox, either last night or this morning. Uh, and that's just for your, your own reading. Um, there's also a file of written testimony um, as well uh, that has been submitted to the committee staff for the for the record. Uh, also, just for the folks who did send that in that is has been distributed out already. Um, and we will also have two um, presentations that will require screen sharing. And I believe um, Ms. Curran has um, those presentations on hand. Uh, but just wanted to, uh, in the very beginning, um, make sure everybody is on the same page. Uh, and of course, the second I go to go to the panel, I click on the wrong button. OK, here we go. All right, so our first uh, panel, um, we are going to start with um, Ricky. Well, I guess, should we just, uh, Rajani, do you want to just introduce the whole panel? And you guys, I don't know if you have to necessarily stick to this order. Um, yeah, yeah, so. thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rajani Uh I am the Director of Mobilization with Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition and a coordinator with the Bridges Coalition for Overdose Prevention Sites. I believe my colleague Ricky Morris is here as well as Ron Phillips, they'll be starting us off. And I would love to, um, I'm actually going to be uh, screen sharing a presentation for the first panel if uh, Ms. Helens, if I can please get a screen share ability, that would be fantastic. Also, uh, Dr. Susan Sherman, who was on the first panel will also need screen share ability. And Ricky is welcome to go ahead and get started uh, as I, oh, here we go, that was fast. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me. Only yes. one person can share the, sh the screen at a time. So gotcha. we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you You're so welcome. much. You're welcome. And Ricky, are you here? I know we've been having some tech stuff. So if Ricky's not here yet, I'm just gonna go ahead and start playing a video that I think is a good way to get us started. Um, I apologize 
let me actually first get us started by saying that Bridges Coalition is presenting here in honor of our fearless harm reduction leader, uh, William Miller Sr., uh, who passed away um, about a month or so ago. And um, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here. And he was actually very actively involved in planning uh, getting this informational hearing going. Um, if you didn't know Senior, um, you knew him. And uh, he helped to start Be More Power. He was a founder of Be More Power, a founder of Bridges, um, worked for Communities United, and uh, helped to start uh, Advisory Board of Charm City Care Connection. Uh, yeah, so we are here in honor of him. Excuse me. Um, and let me start by saying uh, we <clears throat> created a series of six videos uh, at the beginning of last year, we as in the Bridges Coalition, so I'll go ahead and play one. That is a great introduction to Mr. Ricky Morris, uh, who will be speaking shortly. If I have sound ability, which I realize I didn't check, so one second. Sorry, just to check, are people able to hear it? No. no. I didn't hear anything. Uh, sorry, y'all. <laughs> um, Ricky Morris, who is, uh, so Miss Collins, I think that Ricky is on as BHRC, BHRC is the name. And I will work out my tech and he can get started talking if he is able to. So he should be on here. Hello? Hello? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. My name is Ricky Morris. I'm a community outreach organizer um, for Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition, also one of the Bridges leaders, along with Be More Power. I have been working in harm reduction for about four years, four to five. I have lived experience, and um, harm reduction is just basically us teaching people how to be safe and cautious um, in their everyday life. We concentrate on people who use drugs because they're are the ones who are really at risk. But harm reduction can be simple as child proofing your house, fastening a seatbelt. But in these cases, what we try to teach people about is always carrying the locks on. We train them on how to use it appropriately and give them um, different techniques such as not being alone because if they're using and they isolate themselves, if they were to get a hold of something that could be detrimental, no one's there to, you can't give yourself Narcan if you're out. And um, also not sharing needles to cut down on chances of getting hepatitis C or HIV. Um, yeah, there's different levels to harm reduction. And um the thing is that really works with people with lived experiences because the people you're out here teaching it to, they basically look at you and know that you know where they been, you've been where they are, and they know that you really understand, so they know you know what you're talking about, so they're more likely to um, take your advice and um, indulge you and um, really be implemented. It's been successful, um, and I'm very proud 
of the work that the organizations have been doing um, in the harm reduction. We um, are here to try to advocate for um, people to understand that harm reduction is needed in the community. Um, my, my experience is, is like one day I had got the training over at IBR Reach. I'm also a member of IBR Reach, a methadone clinic that um, helped me stabilize my life. And that's where um, I started giving back. I lost a brother to um, an overdose years ago. And it haunted me for years. And it wasn't until I took a simple training on naloxone and I left out the building. And as I turned the corner, there was a lady, a, elder, a lady, a Caucasian lady in the alley in overdose mode. And I say, wow, I just took this training. So I applied it to her and it wound up saving her life. Whereas though they honored me for that, she turned her life around. She's doing so good. She said I was her guardian angel. And at that moment, it clicked that this is a way to honor my brother memory and um, make sure that others don't lose their life unnecessarily. So I was on a mission to... Um, do better to get back to the um, community. And um, yeah, until one day, the pastor, I was on, on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is one of the highest um, drug activities in Baltimore. And Pastor Simmons, who has a church on the avenue, said that somebody dropped dead on the doorsteps of his church and he had been here for over 30 years, and that never happened. And he said, Ricky, I see you out here um, distributing Narcan. I need you to come and teach my congregation how to better be equipped to deal with situations like this. So when I went and, and um, gave a training to the congregation, they were so interesting where they weren't even thinking that they would ever indulge in something like that and um the more that they learned from me the pastor came and said can you come down here every week and welcome the people on the streets of the avenue that's using to come in and get the training to know that they are welcome in the church and they are not looked down upon. And you can train them, and that's what we do every week at Simmons Memorial. We train them and give people knowledge, and they get Narcan. Sometimes they have a place outside where they put the Narcan up in case now even the drug dealers have Narcan, where they say, if someone's old, then we need it because we don't want people dying on our watch, on, with, on our stuff. And that was amazing that they were willing to be concerned about people. And, um, yeah, so that's what um, I think. No, um, harm reduction is all about. It's about empowering people, lifting them up, letting them know that they are life is they are worth living their life, and everybody deserves. Even if they don't get it on the first five tries, if they're still alive, then that sixth try, something might click, and um. When people overdose, it not only affects them, it affects their family members. Think about all the people. It's people on this panel probably. Um, people 
at city council that had family members that might have been lost from this um, epidemic. So we all got to look at it like it's a fight for all of us, not just for some of the people in poverty neighborhoods. This is something that deals with everybody, and we got to do it together. So that's all I wanted to say. And um, I'm going to pass it on to Regine. If that's okay. That's fine. Yeah, we can keep it keep it going. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing your experience. Yeah, for some reason the sound still isn't coming through. Um and we've done this before, so I'm not sure where we got maybe. I think it's uh Mr. Chair, Miss uh, Rajane is up next. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, sorry about that. Not sure why it's not working, but I will just say these are fantastic videos that you can access at baltimoreharmreduction.org slash bridges coalition. It is a total of 13 minutes. Very powerful videos uh, starring our Bridges Coalition members and community members that are talking about what uh, overdose prevention sites will offer Maryland. And I think the highlight of that is that they provide very succinct explanation of what overdose prevention sites are, which we will get into here today also. It's also voices from community members who we've met in doing education and co-learning with community about what OPS can be in Baltimore. And also it's a highlight to show that this movement for overdose prevention sites has been going on in Baltimore for years now. Uh, and so I know for a lot of folks it feels new, but actually there's many of us who've been doing this fight for four, five, six years. And this video series really shows that and demonstrates that because it is from almost two years ago. So I'm actually just gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ron Phillips from Be More Power. He can speak and then I'll actually go right after him because I would love for him to be highlighted for a moment. Thank you everyone and thank you, Ms. Collins. So Ron should be on um, the BHRC, BHRC as well. Is he there? Yes, he's um, in as a panelist. Perfect. And he's in the room with uh, Ricky, actually, safely distanced, wearing masks, I promise everyone. Uh, Ron, are you able to provide your testimony? Um, sure. I'm going to more power. Um, from July 1st, 2019 to July 30th, 2020, uh, the wonderful work at People Power has proved to give out over 14,000 kits, that's harm reduction kits, and over 1,602 overdose reversal which serves as a microcosm of the impact that OPS can have on individuals and community. Getting individuals to traditional forms of recovery and medical services is just the other latent functions that overdose prevention sites will serve if instituted. And that concludes my testimony. Thank you, Ron. So Ron, uh, everyone can hear me okay? 
Yeah. I swear. Tech always. We're going to get there, folks. So um, we got through it during the syringe service expansion education panel. We're getting through it today. So um, Ron and Ricky both are, are with uh, Be More Power, as well as Bridges Coalition, as well as BHRC. We're all a big harm reduction family here in Baltimore. And so I just want to say um, thank you, Ron, so much for sharing that. If folks don't know, Again, some things that uh, I hope that you are now, I'm excited for you to learn about Be More Power. It's been around for about three years. Uh, it is a program that is through, uh, it is funded through BHSB. They are definitely their own kind of powerhouse of dozens of uh, community outreach workers. Their mission is to help people safeguard themselves and their communities from mental, physical, and societal harms. They're here to save lives, reduce harm, and address those risky behaviors that drive up the hepatitis C and HIV AIDS numbers among us. And uh, so you can go to the Go Slow campaign, goslow.com, to learn about that method of harm reduction, to go slow. Uh, and uh, Ron shared these numbers, and I just want to highlight that Be More Power's dozens of outreach workers are highly skilled in responding to overdose and providing referrals to requested services, which are the most important skills to operate overdose prevention sites. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind as we have this informational hearing today, that Bridges Coalition advocates for overdose prevention sites to be legally authorized in the state of Maryland and specifically Baltimore City, that is where most of us call home. Uh, we were founded in March 2017. We're an advocacy coalition working to end overdose and criminalization. We see overdose prevention sites as a tool to intervene on criminalization as well. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think Ron, if you can put yourself on mute because I think you're beeping around. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm distracted. So the uh, mission of Bridges is uh, Yes, to end overdose and criminalization by promoting safe spaces, dignity, health, and justice for people who use drugs. So you'll notice that that mission doesn't specifically say overdose prevention sites or safer consumption spaces. And that's because we view overdose prevention sites as a piece of a, a larger continuum towards ending overdose, towards ending criminalization. And we will not end, Bridges Coalition will not end until that world is seen. And uh, specifically what we envision is a world where, uh, where overdose prevention sites are spaces that are community and peer run, run by folks uh, like from Be More Power, uh, many members of Communities, Communities United, various groups, coming from a social justice framework and a mutual aid grounding that we're all here to, to support each other. We've been talking for like 20, 30 minutes about OPS, but didn't necessarily provide a, a description of what they are, and that's okay because it's all harm reduction. And before we really jump into OPS and what it is, we all need to have a strong understanding of harm reduction, right? Which is what I think Ricky and Ron really helped us to understand. And so what are they? OPS are indoor spaces where individuals can consume their own drugs in the presence of trained professionals, which includes people who use drugs, with immediate access to life-saving interventions, medical care, emotional support, and non-judgmental therapeutic relationships. OPS are not the solution. They are not in competition or replace treatment services. In fact, they work very much in cohesion with treatment services, including clinics that provide methadone, that provide buprenorphine, that provide abstinence-only care. It is all welcome is because we need all, all strategies to help support folks and save lives and help people to thrive. OPS are, are a crisis intervention, or at least that's how they've been set up in the 160 plus sites that they exist, that exist around the world. And they are positioned within the continuum of care to reduce overdose rates. So they would support hospitals, they would support EMS, they would support all of these current uh, agencies and programs that are over capacity to fill this gap. Overdose prevention sites support that. There are over 150, actually it's now over 160, legally operating around the world. Hundreds more operate without legal authority. Now, because we're in Baltimore, I will say we all know what that means. I don't always say this in Annapolis, but you know, it's Baltimore. That means abandoned buildings. That means people in places, right, in alleys, 
taking care of each other, saving each other's lives. That's what we mean by without legal authority. We could be real, right? We know that exists around Baltimore. Baltimore has been doing that. People who use drugs have been saving each other's lives since drugs and humans began interacting with each other. So this is just providing legal authority so that we are not feeling as if we will be highly criminalized or actually taking even more risks because out of fear of policing or various other really terrifying situations. So there are over a hundred that exist around the world, mostly in Europe, Canada, as well as Australia. Philadelphia is out here. We will learn about Philadelphia from, um, from many folks today. Uh, there's also San Francisco, Denver, many, many places in North America, or I'm sorry, in the United States um, that are fighting to have the first overdose prevention site set up in the US, but none yet are legally operating in the United States. Uh, and the biggest thing to keep in mind in all of these spaces with millions, millions of people, millions of injections and various ways of use have occurred in these spaces. Zero overdose deaths, zero. I hope that speaks for itself. There are 28 and growing organizational members of the Bridges Coalition. The list is, is here, right? Y'all are seeing this? Are you seeing anything? Cool, I'm just talking and assuming that I'm sharing content. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I would have told, yeah, but I didn't know you had a point. I had a whole presentation I was showing, it's cool. Um, uh, I, I think I lost, I, I lost access to share content, unfortunately. <laughs> Here we go. That's cool. So I can go back and show you all these wonderful things. Uh, we've already talked about Bridges mission and vision. These are images of existing overdose prevention sites that I was actually looking at that y'all weren't seeing, but that's okay. You can also Google, uh, but these are some images, uh, Canada, Norway, Australia. Again, this is our definition of OPS. I will repeat it again. OPS are indoor spaces where individuals can consume their own drugs in the presence of trained professionals, including people who use drugs with immediate access to life-saving interventions, medical care, emotional support, and non-judgmental therapeutic relationships. I wanted to repeat that and make sure that it's up here visually for folks because that is such a crux of what we're talking about today. locations of where OPS exists around the world, zero overdose deaths. This is our list of 28 organizational members of the Bridges Coalition. I think I have two in my email box that are waiting for me to approve. So it's just growing constantly. About this time last year, we had 20. Two years ago, we had five or six. That just demonstrates, and it's across the state. Today, you'll hear from people from HIPS, Helping Individual Prostitutes Survive is an organization based out of DC that very much supports OPS being legally authorized in Baltimore because they know there'll be an impact in DC as well. So there's lots of organizations here. We'll hear from many of them today. And I'll also say uh, and appreciate you all for the patience as we're taking quite a while to get through this information. Uh, but it is important. In the three and a half years that Bridges has existed, just so folks know, we have, uh, so our different strategies of outreach are to have mobile demonstration overdose prevention sites is, is actually a crux of our uh, outreach strategy. So we have a tent, a pop-up tent that we've set up at uh, Simmons Memorial Church, St. Luke's Church, Yes Drop-In Center, which is Youth Empowered Society, Lexington Market, IBR Reach, um, Maryland Harm Reduction Summit. Uh, I think I'm missing some places, but most of the folks from those sites are actually here today to speak. And it is a demonstration to help community members walk through what an OPS would look like. And, and then just ask questions we would interact. And we interacted with thousands of people. And there are a lot of people who would come back, which is why it says 3000 conversations, because people would come back and say, I had one more question about this. I was thinking about this and I wanna to talk to you. So it's really about building those relationships and engaging in that conversation. We would sit down and we would treat it almost like how we would treat an actual overdose prevention site, being welcoming, being open and saying, let's actually interact and get to know each other as humans so you feel comfortable to come back. 
And that is a major, major uh, tool at an overdose prevention site. It's about supervision, but it's also about creating those relationships to bring people out of isolation, which is what these demonstration OPS did alone. We received about 400 or more testimonials, people writing out why they support overdose prevention sites. We had hundreds of signatures of people asking for Baltimore City to support them. We've also had a strategy of doing community dialogues. We've had about 10 events over the past three and a half years with around 200 people, various hosts. We always go from a social justice perspective. Sometimes these community dialogues are titled Seeking Safety in a War Zone, really framing that that the drug war is real, it is still a thing, and it is rooted in racism and anti-Blackness. Baltimore City, when we have overdose prevention sites legally authorized, will be the first majority Black city to have an overdose prevention site. The places where they exist, we acknowledge, are very homogeneously white or very mixed race and do not have the impacts of the drug war that we have here. And so what would that look like? And we have those conversations. And what do we deserve? We deserve to save our lives, right? So we have those really hard conversations. And then we partner with, and I'm actually gonna segue over to uh, another colleague and uh, partner, Dr. Susan Sherman, to share more data. Uh, but we, we've done a lot of focus groups and surveys uh, as a coalition and in partnership with Johns Hopkins School of Public Health some focus groups, we actually spoke with around 50 treatment provider representatives, and we heard that there's an interest in overdose prevention sites, but everyone really feels uh, need more grounding in harm reduction, right? And the good news is that there's actually decades of data to prove that harm reduction works to save lives and help people feel a sense of dignity and autonomy. We just need to make sure people really absorb that information. Um, one of the surveys was with candidates. So some of you actually took the survey and we were curious about candidates in Baltimore City and how they thought about OPS. And a vast majority actually support the idea of overdose prevention sites in Baltimore. We are happy to share the results of that survey with anybody interested. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, in case this is new, 2021 will be the sixth year that overdose uh, bill to authorize overdose prevention sites will be brought to uh, to the General Assembly. Six years. And this is a little image that shows the growth of that. It started as a House bill with Delegate Dan Morheim as a kind of a lone wolf. And over time, bridges grew and then it became, a, then there was a state bill and we increased and increased numbers of co-sponsors. And in this next year, 2021, due to COVID-19 protocols, we will not be able to get co-sponsors for bills. That is one of the ways to prevent kind of cross-contamination. There will only be one champion from the state, one champion from the House, but I want everyone to remember that we had 41 co-sponsors in the House this, this year, 2020, and seven to nine in the, in the Senate Finance Committee, which are folks on the Senate Finance Committee, that's pretty good numbers because it's a pretty tough group. Amazing, amazing numbers. And so we will, uh, we know that there's increased numbers of supported pol supportive policymakers at the state and in the city. and. Uh, and it's really exciting work. So six years and going, and that's about it. I'm gonna go, go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Susan Sherman to share some amazing uh, information and I will stop sharing. And uh, yes, and Ms. Collins, if you can please give Dr. Sherman uh, screen share access, that would be wonderful. Thank you. If you, in 30 seconds, I wanna say thank yous before, I don't wanna miss anyone. Uh, Thanks so much, uh, Regini, for that. And I really appreciate I am um, from Johns Hopkins, uh, the Spark Center. Can you see my screen now? Good. OK, I'm from Hopkins School of Public Health, as Regini said, and I've been doing harm reduction research and drug policy research and activism for the past 20 years in Baltimore. And I also am involved with the Spark Center, which is in southwest Baltimore. And uh, even during COVID, we reach close to 200 women each, re each week providing harm reduction services, food, clothing, and kindness. Um, I really appreciate, thank you, Council Member Burnett, for uh, hosting this, and City Council President, almost Mayor um, Scott, Senator Hedelman, and other Council Members and Bridges. It's really unbelievable after so long to see so many people in government just embrace harm reduction as something that's like, yeah, yeah, 
why aren't we doing this? Um, something that makes sense, something that's an, an evidence-based response in so many ways to really bad racist drug policies, as Reginie said. One word I really want to mention about OPS before I go and talk about study findings hot off the press uh, is that it really focuses, it really centers people's lived experiences and it treats people with dignity and respect. And that's just not to be underestimated. Even people working at places like overdose prevention sites, how empowering to be able to provide a full range of services that we know save lives. And it's empowering to people to be able to go to a place that's safe, not inject drugs or feel shame going into an abandoned minion, uh, going into a place where they're seen when they aren't seen many, many times in their life. So now if we could share the screen and tell me, I can't see, so just tell me when you can see this, please. Okay. Um, so... I'm going to talk to you, as I said, hot off the press, a study called the Connect Study that was funded by the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. I tried other funding and couldn't get it funded, um, which is a study that, you know, so many times business owners are really, when we don't engage them in the process of putting physical buildings with methadone clinics, drug treatment programs, they are, they are uh, the less involved they are before it happens, the more they are involved when it's about to happen or when it happens. So um, we thought it was really interesting to get an understanding of business owners' experience with people who use drugs and drug use around their businesses in areas that are impacted by drug use as we determined through mapping 2017 arrest data and 911 mentions of drug use. So we created maps of neighborhoods that had concentration of drug use activity. And then we went and did a lot of ride along, a lot of uh, windshield tours and looked and came up with a list of 119 businesses. And then we ended up with what we wanted to be was 150, but uh, COVID hit and it really reduced our ability to go out. Although the last 20 we got during COVID, um, the beginning of COVID. So this study aimed to understand the experiences and attitude experiences around drug use, attitudes towards overdose prevention site, harm reduction in general, syringe service programs, because we know that business owners are greatly impacted by drug use and when given information can be huge allies in supporting something that actually takes drug use out of their front, out of their bathrooms, um, et cetera. So um, we asked lots of different questions. We asked about naloxone. Um, we also did a physical survey for us to take an environmental scan, looking at uh, drug use that we saw around the store. Um, and you can see this is the breakdown of the types of businesses. We, we didn't do McDonald's and bigger stores right aid because uh, oftentimes it's hard to get permission. And also we wanted to stick to more local stores and not chains. It's hard to talk to people who actually work at those stores. Um, so just to start with their experiences with drug use, about 92, most everyone reported people who use drugs frequent their businesses. They knew that by seeing people, by talking to people. Um, and there was concern that people who use drugs could impact their business from theft and panhandling and drug use inside of the business. I'll say that very, very few businesses had naloxone. And of course, that's something that would be really useful. There have been studies in New York where um, they actually gave businesses naloxone, something people should have on hand. But of course, they don't want to have to have this issue. Um, and this is just more laying the, uh, setting the context of what uh, drug use specifically they had experiences within and around their business. So in the past six months, close to half found drugs, two thirds saw drug use, over two thirds saw drug dealings, about half found drug paraphernalia, and almost half saw an overdose either within or in the proximity of their business. And of course, you know, people don't want to be going out um, if in a place public like that. There's a lot, uh, luckily people can see them, but it's uh, without naloxone there, the chances of 911 or the being called police showing up is higher. All right. So the great news is 
that 65% of people of the people surveyed actually supported overdose prevention sites being implemented in their neighborhood. 80% supported them being implemented um, in a different neighborhood. The black indicates um, being uh, supporting drug each of these drug treatment, OPS, and drug checking um, in a different neighborhood, and the gray is in people's own neighborhood. But, you know, in terms of this is a starting place for a lot of people they hadn't heard about overdose prevention sites until this survey, this is a really good starting place. Like, we can work with two-thirds of people supporting this in their neighborhood in talking about why the rest to the rest of the 35%, why it's useful uh, for it to be in their neighborhood. I know from our establishing the Spark Center, the businesses were really worried around us that there would be, it's a center for women engaged, um, non-men who are engaged in the street economy, sex work, drug use, and any person who uh, wants to come into the Spark Center to gain services. People were really concerned that we were, um, it was going to create crowds of people in front of the building. And what we found was in the neighborhood association that we went to meetings before we started, what the whole time that we've been there for the past three years, people love it because nobody's hanging out front. If you do your job right, people are coming inside to where you want them to be to get the services, food, hangout, yoga, buprenorphine, as in the case with Spark, to get the services they need. So if you engage businesses in the process, I think it can be a win-win. And these numbers were very encouraging for us. Um, in terms of acting of those um, people that supported overdose prevention sites, we wanted to know why they supported it, what impact they saw. Almost everyone thought that they would reduce drug deaths. Uh, uh, two thirds thought that they would en um, enable drug use, attract people who use drugs and drug dealers, attract crime. You can see that. But the higher rates in all of these are positive things. Benefit the community, reduce drug paraphernalia and reduce drug deaths. Those were endorsed by the most number of people. And just to say that people in looking at a statistical model support for OPS was higher if people had witnessed an overdose in their business, if they interacted with people who were experiencing homelessness, if they believe that people who use drugs to, um, deserve treatment, and if they thought that OPS could reduce deaths um, and drug paraphernalia and benefit in the community. So people that endorsed each of those things were more likely to support OPS. Lack of less OPS support was associated with people who had, interestingly enough, bathroom only policies for employees. So that likely meant that in the past they had bad experiences with people using their bathrooms, people that believe people who use drugs are dangerous, and people who thought that OPS would do negative things to the neighborhood. I want to acknowledge the um, Sabaru Hani who led uh, this study with me, Miles Morris uh, and Noel Pink who both worked on the study um, and knocked on lots of businesses doors. It, it took us contacting about 400 businesses to get 135 who would participate. And that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And um, thank you, Dr. Sherman. And I think um, Vicki Walters is the last person on our panel, number one. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, making sure my, um, my sound is working. So thank you to members of the Health Committee, um, Committee Chair Burnett, and uh, to Mayor-elect Council President Scott for allowing me to come and talk to you a little bit today. Um, about the importance um, that your consideration to allow overdose and disease prevention site programs um, to operate in Baltimore City is to the treatment community in Baltimore City at large. Um, my name is Vicki Walters. I operate a substance use disorders treatment program in Baltimore City, um, IBR REACH. We are a member of the coalition. And I'm also the current president of the Maryland Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence, Maytod for short, um, which has over 75 members statewide, and we have 30 Baltimore City Opioid Treatment Program members. I'm also the immediate past president of the Baltimore City Directorate. I think Reginie mentioned them earlier. 
and that's a citywide member agency of 20 treatment programs in Baltimore City, including which includes providers from all levels of care, from prevention to inpatient and residential programs. So both May Todd and the directorate are supporters of overdose prevention sites, as many of our city residents are struggling with the increased needs and risks um, of overdose, and especially right now with the pandemic, because we know that our patient population is most vulnerable to both overdose and to COVID infections. As Mayor Scott says, I think it's really time that we did something different. The same old, same old just isn't working anymore. Um, a lot of what I, had planned to say to you has already been said by Regine, um, by Ricky, by Dr. Sherman. Um, but, you know, as Regine said, the Drug Policy Alliance reports that there are over 160 such spaces worldwide and that there are numerous studies based on decades of research because they've been around for um, many of them for a long time since the late 90s, mid to late 90s, um, that there are numerous studies for, for uh, supporting the efficacy um, that people using overdose prevention sites are oftentimes introduced to treatment services as well. Not that that's the primary goal, but it does often introduce people to treatment. There's also data from Canada to support that besides saving lives, overdose prevention sites reduce the spread of hepatitis and HIV risk behaviors like needle sharing, as Dr. Sherman said. Um, they also um, prevent um, patients from congregating in public areas to use drugs, or I say patients, I'm sorry, um, people with addiction to um, congregate, in, congregate in public areas, and um, discarded needles on our streets and our um, playgrounds, et cetera. So, it, as Regine said, it's been a long time coming. We, um, the directorate and Maytod, we have been supporters um, for the last six years, along with the Harm Reduction Coalition, we've gone to Annapolis every year to advocate for overdose prevention sites. I'd really love to see Baltimore City take the lead on this. And I'm, I guess I'm going to finish by saying, um, as a dear friend of mine over 25 years just said to me a few months ago that she was never a supporter of this idea, but she'd give anything to have her 27-year-old daughter back, who was recently found um, actually brain dead of an overdose in a Baltimore City West, uh, in a West Baltimore City hotel. Um, and so I think that it's really important that we um, decide that we're going to really kind of step out there and do something different now and that there's so much research and there's so much information out there that show that this really can help save lives, um, that it can help prevent the spread of infectious disease. So it's a real public health policy, I think, um, importance. Um, so thank you for allowing me to talk a little bit about this today. And I do want you to know that there are many treatment providers who support this throughout Baltimore City and throughout the state as well. And we'd be willing to work with the city council, with the um, organizations that are gonna be here today to talk about this, um, to help figure out how to best do this in Baltimore City. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Rajini, is this the, that was the last, last speaker for this panel, correct? Yes, it was. Okay. Yes. All right. Oh, so, um, thank you all. Uh, it was incredibly informative. Uh, and I know I learned a lot about this issue. Um, and for those who were unable to, to well, I guess we were not able to hear the sound for the videos, but the link to view them is in the chat box uh, for everyone that's watching uh, virtually. Um, for those that have dialed in, um, you can uh, use a search engine to uh, find Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition and on their webpage uh, has a lot more information that we shared today or supportive information that we shared today as well as uh, testimonial videos. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, I do want to offer the committee members uh, the opportunity to ask questions here for this panel before we move to city agencies. Uh, I have one. Uh, Council member Clark, I think. Uh, your video is off. Couldn't see. Oh. It's me. I okay. There we go. I can see you now. <laughs> All right. Councilmember Clark. Yes, um, I I wasn't vis visible, but I was all listening, and but I have a basic question, and it's probably already been answered in the context of 
going to the state. But um, I read the reports that came in and I listened today. It sounds, it sounds like the days when we were talking about needle exchanges and, you know, working our way through being able to achieve um, exchanges in Baltimore. And now we take them for granted. But I, I promise you, it was a struggle um, and led by some wonderful people, not me, but as a supporter. Um, this sounds like the same kind of good thing to happen, um, especially that mother who lost her daughter um, and, and people who are, we are losing because we don't have things like, we don't have places like this. Question. How, where does the law have to change, or does it, for the city of Baltimore to establish such places? And does it matter whether the city establishes them or if they just happen? So that's those are my questions. Thank you so much, Councilperson Clark. I really, really appreciate that question um, and your support of, of harm reduction for for many years, uh, decades. So uh, I can just speak quickly to that. And I, I'm actually really excited um, that uh, Michael Collins from the state's attorney's office will be speaking uh, as a city uh, from the city agencies panel to uh, hopefully speak more lawyerly about this, uh, or at least representing uh, that more legal that I do not have. I do not have that lawyerly, <laughs> the general lawyerliness. But, but I will say that the the exciting, really amazing thing that has happened in the past year or two is the the case of Safe House, uh, the state or the federal government court case around Safe House, which is a. Um, uh, it's in Philadelphia, and it is a space, a nonprofit organization that has been working to to get uh, authorization to be a, an overdose prevention site. And so they actually got support from many, many city agencies and the mayor and police chief and city council, and they got a lot of city support. And the state of Pennsylvania chose to kind of take a, a Switzerland approach, right? Like, we will make no comment. We will not do anything. And, and with that, it, they didn't provide protection to their city jurisdiction, right? The state of Pennsylvania. And so then the federal government, and this was 2019, um, there was a court case saying that it actually, that the that safe house would be uh, violating some federal laws that are outdated from the 1980s, uh, which was actually called the crack house statute, which we have to be honest and recognize the complete offensiveness of that well, language, was, right? It was it during was the current administration, yeah. of course. Right. And then, then there's this current administration. But the exciting thing is that the safe, safe House actually won the court case and the judge uh, ruled in their favor. But there's been this regular battle from federal versus city for some time. And so and so the real lesson I think that's important for us to take is that we have state support here. Pennsylvania did not does not have Philadelphia, I mean, doesn't have the state support that we do here in Maryland. The fact that this bill has been here for six years. So uh, so that's that's the kind of precedent that I can give a summary of. But again, I, I'm really excited for um, for the for the lawyer folks to. to so, so, so basically, it's the feds that are the legal problem. It can be. Uh, yeah, well, we are going into another praise the Lord administration if we can just get there yeah um, and so so basically they're doing this in philadelphia with the city right or with they've been at, they haven't been able sorry to interrupt you they haven't been able to open yet and that's for various reasons including covid19 which we do have yeah. folks speaking to today who will speak to what existing overdose prevention sites are doing and are actually operating amidst COVID-19 protocol. So that's an exciting uh, information we will hear about today, uh, later today. But with okay. Philadelphia, there's so many pieces. They didn't want to necessarily start the first uh, OPS in this moment, but there were a lot of legal issues 
uh, that again, I'm not necessarily fully um, able to speak to. Okay. But I think that the also clear thing to name is with the bill at the Maryland state level, it is an authorization for any organization, community-based organizations, faith-based hospitals to be protected for that establishment. Right, so it basically means like if uh, if healthcare for the homeless, which is a member of Bridges Coalition, if they were to say we want to be legally protected uh, to offer overdose prevention services, that building, people who are possessing, who are in possession of drugs or using drugs in that building, would be protected from the law. So that's what it's like a about. sanctuary. Yes, it's like a sanctuary. Yeah, and okay. that is what the bill offers that, so to allow community-based protection. Now, has this bill been approved or is it pending? Yes, for 2021, yes, yes absolutely. Effect. Yep, Senator uh, Hedelman and uh, Delegate oh, Melnick will be bringing it forward. Yes, and, and so your, so your arg the argument for the city of Baltimore to somehow create these sanctions or do do whatever it can to protect and to at least those people in in enfolded in a place of yes yeah, we and I can and I'm I have I have a very hard time not just being honest and bold. So I'm just going to say it is what we're hoping for is that Baltimore City will authorize overdose prevention sites to be legally to be legally operating in the city of Baltimore. So much like the syringe service uh, rules, right, the laws of the early 90s, where Baltimore City allowed for syringe services in Baltimore City. Right. Right. And then that later. Granted, decades later, hopefully it'll be a little faster with OPS, if Baltimore City authorizes overdose prevention sites in the city, allowing community-based organizations to op operate them. And then hopefully that will, once we continue to prove the amount of lives that we are saving and supporting, then hopefully the state of Maryland will follow suit. But we do believe that is something Baltimore City can do, is to authorize overdose prevention sites in the city. That's, you've answered my question. Thank you very much. I just... Yeah. What do you want? Uh, I mean, I you know, this is an educational informational session. No, so I'm no, not trying I know. To <laughs> but yes, that is what we want. Absolutely. You're, you're all too passionate to not want. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wanted to know what it is. Now, I'm going out of office, but um, the, everybody that's been the real leaders on this effort, they're coming back. Yeah, well, and um, I'll call them up if they're not doing the right thing. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll let them know that if they're not hearing it now. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you so much. All right, Council Member Clark. Uh, any yeah. questions uh, from the committee or other council members on the on the line? Um, I know the one question I had uh, was if if you. You or any member of the panel could elaborate a little further on, uh, I guess, two areas. One, a little bit more on like what these can look like. I guess what type to models. Uh, I know it was uh, covered a little bit in your presentation, um, but just like a quick recap of how that would like contextualize into Baltimore. Uh, and two, um, it, obviously, you may or may not know this, but uh, precautions that these sites are taking in other places uh, for for COVID nineteen. Great, thank you. I'm actually going to invite um, Dr. Sherman. I know that you have uh, done a lot of research on different models and what might work in Baltimore. And so I'm wondering if you would be able to speak to the different models that exist. Susan, Susan, Susan. You call me Susan. <laughs> I'm being very but we're not right on now. camera. Yes, Susan, I know, please. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. Thank you. So thanks for asking that. And I mean, I just have to tell you that it's just such music to our collective ears to my ears, like the support, no opposition, anyone saying, and just the general good vibe. Um, so they can look different ways. The, interestingly enough, the Vancouver Insight, which has been in Vancouver, there are lots of
places now in Vancouver uh, safe injection facilities, overdose prevention sites. But the original one that was in a building, actually, it looks like a very sterile clinic with 13 cubbies with, you know, kind of if you think of like study spaces divided by dividers, mirrors in front, they're in a semicircle so that the nurse or practitioner who's sitting behind them can see everyone to make sure if anybody goes out. And it really is a sterile environment to Amsterdam that has like a living room with couches. So they can look in different ways. The model that um, we talk about a lot, we've I've talked about a lot in Baltimore is, you know, more of that model where people are going to get lots of different services and you'll be able to see people when they're using more of like insight. Um, the other thing that's really important about them and what uh, their different models where it's in a mobile mobile van in some cities like in Barcelona, so it reaches more people or um uh, or it's just a standalone room, like next to the bu- the bus station in Europe. It's just a single room. The model that I that's you know best in terms of outcomes, uh, like anything, is an integrate a model that's uh, a safe injection facility or overdose prevention site that's integrated with other services. So has a case manager, has access to food and clothing, et cetera, which makes sense. Any service is better when it's integrated so people can do one-stop shopping. Insight has a drug treatment facility on top of it called Onsite. And Vicky kind of alluded to the fact there have been a number of studies that have shown the more people go to the overdose prevention site Insight, the more likely they are to enter drug treatment. So that's another service that can be integrated into this model. So what it could look like, Regine can talk to. I mean, hopefully... There's not going to only be one. We know people don't cross MLK. We know people don't cross Falls Road. They're like different quadrants that have drug use and should be covered, hopefully, in Baltimore. Okay. Uh, and Councilman McClark, you had a follow-up on that? Oh, okay. Sorry. I saw your hand go up. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the council or the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you all uh, again. And if uh, council members have other questions come up, I, I think all of these folks uh, are gonna be here for the remainder of the hearing. So we'll come back to you. Um, all right, so now we are going to move uh, to our uh, agencies. And uh, I think it's to build on the council member Clark's question. Let's start with uh, Michael Collins from the state's attorney's office. Hey everyone, um, Michael Collins here from the State's Attorney's Office. <clears throat> I can't believe Regine has volunteered me to take over the loyalty part of this conversation. Um, I'll try my best. I'll try to drop in some Latin phrases and Ali McBeal references as I, as I go along. But I know this is um, you know, a tremendously exciting day for folks in the harm reduction movement. I just want to you know, applaud the council members and applaud the, the folks that have been working on these issues for years now, if not over a decade. Um, and it's great to see this this hearing come together. Um, you know, hopefully folks won't be too disappointed that the state's attorney herself can't be here. Um, I'll try and be an adequate replacement, but I do have a lot of passion for this issue. Um, you know, having been at Drug Policy Alliance for six years, working on these types of policies to end the war on drugs, reduce mass, mass incarceration, lower the number of over those deaths. Um, you know, in terms of the latest data, um, I think the first quarter of this year shows that we lost 205 people to opioid related deaths. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of attention and rightly so on the terrible homicide rate, but drug overdose re- deaths are on track to be more than double that rate. Um, and, and as was mentioned before, the coronavirus has, has likely exacerbated the problem. Um, the war on drugs has not stopped drug use or its over- or overdose fatalities. Instead, heavy-handed drug enforcement and tough on crime mentalities around drug use have led us to mass incarceration, increased racial, di- racial disparities in the justice system, and caused further health and social harms to people who use drugs. Because of this, we must stop stigmatizing drug use and instead treat it as a public health issue. That's why I'm here today to provide support from our office for an evidence-based program that works and saves lives. The time is now to implement evidence-based responses to drug 
use that both reduce harm and help to mitigate the consequences of overcriminalisation. Two years ago, I had the opportunity to visit an overdose prevention site in Barcelona, and I witnessed firsthand how these sites not only saved lives. Locals who may have been sceptical at first recognised the benefits of these facilities, as Susan mentioned, reducing street drug use and other uh, unsafe practices. Overdose prevention sites have proven that they are effective in mitigating the danger of opioid use and can help users sometimes connect to treatment and other services. The first site began in the 1980s in Switzerland. There are, as was mentioned, approximately 120 <coughs> overdose prevention sites currently operating around the globe. It's a centerpiece of Canada's overdose prevention strategy, which has you know, similar challenges with fentanyl, but there are none in the US yet. Um, evidence shows that these sites help people connect to treatment, reduce um, public use, um, reduce the uh, spread of, of uh, diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C. Um, as was mentioned, there's never been a single overdose fatality at an OPS. Um, you know, generally they play this bigger role and vital role as we try and move towards a, a public health towards uh, a public health approach towards uh, drug policy. And as was mentioned, they're not supposed to replace the existing prevention, harm reduction and treatment interventions, but they're supposed to be uh, a complement to them and, try and, and also to try and move us away from uh, the criminalisation of what is a health problem. Um, you know, as a city and as a country, I'm, I'm glad to see us moving away from the war on drugs model. In March, our office stopped prosecuting drug possession uh, and drug paraphernalia, among other minor offences. The police or partners have mostly followed suit and drug possession arrests are down 75%. The overall jail population is down 45%. We initially took this approach because of the coronavirus and its threat to people who reside and work in correctional facilities, but we're also pleased to see support from treatment professionals and even the Baltimore Sun recently through their editorial board wrote that arrest is not the answer to helping people with drug addictions. Um, embracing overdose prevention sites is in line with this shift away from the war on drugs. Um, there was previously just a discussion about federal law. You know, it's often said that federal law is an, over, is an obstacle to opening an overdose prevention site, but it's important to remember a few th things. First, those wishing to open a site in Philadelphia have already defeated the Department of Justice on this matter in the federal court with many prosecutors, including our office, signing on to an amicus brief in support of the uh, safe house case. Um, the Department of Justice, as mentioned, is in the middle of appealing that loss. It's being litigated, but it's unclear that that litigation will continue under the Biden administration. Um, secondly, and perhaps more importantly, the history of drug policy reform in this country is one of local jurisdictions taking action in the face of federal intransigence. Numerous states have legal marijuana. Our own state has medical marijuana. It's still illegal under federal law. Um, in the early 90s, Mayor Kurt Schmoke, who previously occupied the seat as the city's state's attorney, he assailed the federal government's war on drugs and set up one of the country's first needle exchanges. I believe that our city can be at the forefront of these best practices once again. We have new leadership coming to the city council. We have the support of public health officials and the example of countless countries who have these sites. And most importantly, we have a chance to save lives. I urge council members to grasp this chance with both hands and support overdose prevention sites in our city. Our office stands ready and willing to work with you on this important issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, are there, uh, Councilmember Clark, specifically, did you have any follow up? Uh, I mean, obviously, open to questions from anyone in the committee or a council. But you know, I, 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 you know, my question that I'm, I'm going to ask, which is a little bit more in, information about our ability to authorize as a city, if you have any opinions about that. But the reason I've waved my hand is that. Every time I hear needle exchange, I hear the mayor who was very, very important in that issue. But I have to say the name Salima Marriott because she waged the war before it became 
uh, politically um, known and accepted. And she's still around, but she's not in office anymore. She was a delegate at the time. She is needle exchange. And that's the kind of that's the kind of um, champions we need. And I'm looking at a whole bunch of them right now. Thank you. Thanks, I was kind of frozen there. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. I didn't have any follow up. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I don't see any other hands raised from the committee or anything. So, um, next up, we have the Baltimore City Health Department. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Paul Niver. I'm representing the Baltimore City Health Department. And I am actually joined by our director of overdose prevention, uh, Ms. Brittany Spencer, who has prepared a presentation on behalf of our department. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to yield my time to her. Thank you. Um, and uh, we need screen or sharing abilities. Thank you. And the I think we're we're getting some feedback in here. Hmm. There we go. Thank you. Thank you to Paul and thank you, Council Chair Burnett, Mayor Elect, uh, and City Council President Scott, and the entire City Council for bringing this important resolution to City Council. Um, uh, my name is Brittany Spencer. I'm the Director of Opioid Overdose Prevention at the Baltimore City Health Department. Um, and hopefully, you all can see my screen. Can you see my screen? It's not showing. It's not showing. No? Okay, let's try that again. Now you can see it? Okay, great. Now if I can make it bigger. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, a lot of this information has already been covered. Uh, by Reggie, by uh, Dr. Sherman and Vicki and um, Michael Collins. Um, so sorry if there's some repeat information, but I really wanted to be sure to highlight um, all of the questions that were posed in this resolution so that there could be um, you know, enough information to take away from this. Um, because there is so much information out there and it's hard to condense into a, a short presentation. So with that, um, we will start with what is an overdose prevention site. So as uh, Regine showed, I just wanted to be able to provide a visual for you all to see what this actually looks like. This is actually the one that is one of the ones that are in Vancouver. Um, an OPS is defined as a harm reduction intervention that helps to mitigate the harms of drug use through on-site monitoring and rapid intervention by trained staff in the case of an overdose. The model of harm reduction program aimed at reducing harm to clients' health while connecting them to recovery and care. And I think that that is the most important thing to highlight there that as Regine and all everybody else on this um, panel has mentioned that it is, it, it's really, OPSs are beyond, um, you know, just safe consumption. It's really that um, creation of community and care and recovery. Uh, the harm reduction program is part of a continuum of care for people with substance use challenges who often have complex medical needs, including severe mental illness, HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C. So services that are provided in an OPS are um, vast and not limited to those on your screen, um, but safe consumption uh, observed by um, staff, medical staff members, um, education and access to medicated assisted treatment, recovery counseling, basic medical services, referrals, support services, such as housing, public benefits, and legal services. And again, as well as creating a um, sense of community and belonging. Current OPS locations and outcomes. Um, there's over 150 OPSs as mentioned um, in 11 countries and two in the planning phase. So we have Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands, Sydney, Australia. Canada, Spain, Denmark, Norway, France, Australia, Luxembourg, Ireland, and Scotland. Uh, several cities in the U.S. have pursued opening an OPS, and Philadelphia's safe house, as mentioned previously, has come the farthest and is awaiting resolution of a uh, civil 
lawsuit filed by U.S. attorney from uh, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. So I just wanted to highlight some of the outcomes uh, from some of the locations. Um, Vancouver, we actually were, were lucky enough to have uh, representatives from a couple of these uh, locations, Portugal and Vancouver come. It was about a year ago now uh, that they came to Baltimore and talked with us. Um, so I just wanted to highlight some of the outcomes from a few of these places. So um, the uh, Vancouver site, uh, specifically at Insight, has seen over 3.6 million visitors uh, since opening in 2003. Uh, they've had almost 50,000 clinical treatment visits and 64,000 overdose interventions without any deaths. Because as uh, Regine uh, stated, there has been zero overdose deaths at any of these uh, locations. Uh, they've shown a 35% reduction in mortality within 500 meters of, of the facility within three years of opening. So it not only impacts the, it really impacts the neighborhood in which they're in. So, uh, you know, to Dr. Sherman's um, presentation, talking about where they would want it, um, really providing education to the fact that it does impact the neighborhood, not just the people within it. Um, a 2012 study found that 75% of Insight clients reported a change in their injection uh, behavior as a result of uh, using their services. And I recall uh, when Portugal, when the representative from Portugal was uh, talking about the site that she runs, um, she had mentioned that a lot of the individuals um, that were coming there, you know, they were using less because they wanted to be a part of, like I said, the community and um, the the community that's built within there. And so they would have activities and so people would use less so that they could participate in those activities. Um, a 2007 study found that 23% of respondents uh, who had been an Insight client had stopped injecting by the end of the study period and another 50% had entered addiction treatment. Uh, the site in Sydney, Australia, since opening in 2001, they've seen 65,000 clients. They've supported uh, uh, 85,000, 8,500 uh, overdose reversals, zero fatalities again, 14,500 referrals made to ongoing care and support. Um, a 2015 study showed that 15,000 people registered, 10,000 of them had never accessed any local health service prior to accessing the site. And I think that that's important to point out because these are 10,538 people that otherwise went missed with any type of medical care beyond substance use. Um, we're talking about hypertension, diabetes, wound care, all of the things that go into keeping us uh, safe and healthy. Uh, during the hours of operation, the neighborhood saw a 44% decrease in the average monthly ambulance attendances um, by EMS when compared to the overall period prior to opening. So Spain, um, overdose deaths uh, were reduced by nearly 50%, uh, 18, 1,833 in 1991 to 773 by 2008. Uh, new HIV infections decreased among OPS clients from 19.1% in 2004 to 8.2% in 2008. And so you notice that some of these statistics are a little outdated and, and it was prior to fentanyl. So you could only imagine what the numbers would be uh, now as fentanyl has come in to the, the drug supplies. Um, participants' awareness of, of safer injection techniques have improved. Community awareness about OPS and the public health strategy towards drugs has increased. And littering uh, of injection paraphernalia in public spaces was reduced. And again, these are just some of the highlights. Um, this is definitely not everything. Um, pertaining to those uh, locations. Uh, so fitting into Baltimore City's um, evidence-based approach, uh, the principles really are in line with the current evidence-based harm reduction approach in Baltimore City, saving lives in the lock zone, increasing access to on-demand treatment, um, and fighting stigma with education. It's difficult to quantify what it would look like in Baltimore City because there is not one in the U.S., uh, but a study led by Bloomberg School of Researchers, including Dr. Sherman, uh, published this June in the Journal of the Urban Health found that 77% of, of 326 people surveyed uh, would would uh, use such a site. So these would be used in, in Baltimore City. 
So speaking to the legal and economic challenges, um, you know, as mentioned, establishing an OPS would need federal and state support, uh, which were uh, mentioned by Rajani that, you know, Maryland does have the state support. Uh, funding would be needing, needed to establish an OPS. However, I did want to point out that a 2017 uh, Baltimore-focused study by Dr. Sherman um, estimated that 1.8 million annual investment in an OPS would save the healthcare system $7.8 million each year through reductions in infections such as HIV, hepatitis C, ambulance calls, emergency visits, and hospitalizations. Um, and one other thing that um, I recalled when, again, when we had this uh, visit from uh, Vancouver representative, uh, he was discussing the difficulties that they had, um, you know, really trying to build that relationship with police. Um, and now after a few years, they're actually one of their biggest supporters and a Vancouver inspector now spends um, his off time training law enforcement around the world, including New York City. Um, on the transformation of his uh, police department and his opinion of OPS. And so I just wanted to touch a little bit on Philadelphia's fight for an OPS and kind of where they stand. I think we've, you know, everybody has kind of pointed out where they are right now. Um, their plans to open in March of 2020 came to a stop uh, when community and community led leaders uh, you know, there was just a little bit of lack of maybe talking to the, the community. Um, and so that led to the government filing an emergency motion. Um, and any urgency to address the motion quickly dissipated with COVID-19, um, uh, civil unrest uh, after the killing of George Floyd. Um, it really was overshadowed. Um, so that right now, um, Safe House is still legaling the, the, the legal battle based on the belief. They are battling it based on the belief that um, the 21 U.S. Code um, Section 856 was never intended to apply and does not apply to a nonprofit providing a good faith public health approach to overdose prevention services, including supervised consumption room. So as of right now in, 20, in June 2020, the federal, the same federal judge ruled that it was in the public's best interest that the site be barred from opening while federal prosecutors appeal its legality, putting its 2019 ruling on hold. That is the end of my presentation. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd just like to add, um, I know that there's been a lot of talk about uh, the role that Mayor Schmoke and um, some of his colleagues in the council um, had had on um, essentially uh, advocating for harm reduction within the city. And I just wanted to note it, that we had advocates within the health department as early as uh, the late 80s with Dr. Maxi Collier, um, who were out there in the field treating folks um, with substance use disorder and had essentially been advocating for a lot of these uh, programs that we see here today that have been phenomenal successes like syringe exchange. And uh, I, I always wanna take a moment to highlight Dr. Collier's um, contributions as our first black um, health commissioner here in Baltimore City and um, the amazing work that um, he set up for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the committee or the health department? I saw a thumbs up from Councilmember Clark and the hand raised. Um, yes. Uh, that, so, what are the what are the plans that the health department has about these these centers? Um, or what, what, what state, I know nobody ever has enough money, yada, yada, but setting that aside, uh, what are the, what, what would give the health department pause before it begins to explore a pilot? So, uh, Councilwoman, uh, 
there's a number of different issues that um, could potentially be at play. A lot of it has to do with some of the hurdles that have been put forth by this current administration. Uh, this current you mean administration. Trump? Yes, exactly. Um, and so there's always been the potential of losing federal funding, um, uh, pursuing these, uh, you know, not exactly sanctioned um, facilities. And so, um, you know, there's been instances wherein we've attempted to pursue certain um, public health measures and because they were and against the grain of the, the um, current federal policy, um, there was the potential of losing funding. And so we've kind of had to tow a number of different lines. So with the new administration, we'd really want clarity on how things are looking in terms of legality and what their stance is going to be, because um, even during the um, President Obama administration, there was um, sort of murky gray zone um, with respect to these types of facilities. And so we want uh, clarity before we pursued any additional um, um, measures on our behalf. Uh, if, I, if I may say so, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, but thanks to this hearing, of course, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Um, it sounds as if we need to, as a city in the new administration, um, call on the president of the United States, Biden, and his attorney general to step back from that case that's pending about Pennsylvania and like get out of there and leave it alone, as if I'm reading that right or hearing it right get that off the table and then ask for some kind of um guarantees of uh pro allowing protection to uh at least allowing protection to people who would be within uh you within a center as a as a, a client as a as a helper, a volunteer, a, or a professional. It, it, I think if we could do those two things, we might be able to have a conversation, don't you think? Or maybe, you know, you got to check in, but um, I would say that, get out of this suitcase, as Nemi DiPietro would call it, get out of this suitcase we're in and get, and also um, get, the right of protection, maybe through the state or wherever that comes. Where is who is who is in charge of protection? But I I know what you mean, what the advocates mean. And thank you, and thanks for mentioning Dr. Collier. Thank you. Um, seeing the, no other. Uh, Questions from the committee. Um, thank you, um, the health department staff. We're going to move to uh, the Baltimore Police Department. Let's see, Michelle. Here we are. Hi. Good. <clears throat> good morning, uh, Mayor Lex Scott, Chairman Bur Burnett, members of the committee. Um, before I, I, I start, I just want to um, kind of echo some of the things that some of the advocates have have been discussing. Um, this topic is, is, is a very personal topic for, for lots of us and for lots of families. Um, I will tell you that uh, my youngest brother uh, has overdosed at least 10 times that we know of. Um, he's currently on the streets of Philadelphia um, and we don't know where he is. And so every single time my personal phone rings, I get anxious uh, and worried that you know, this time is, is the time. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that a bit because some of the other folks were, were personal about their struggles. Um, I will say um, I am joined uh, by Deputy Commissioner Michael Sullivan, who is our Deputy Commissioner in charge of operations. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully you all have our bill report. It was sent a little bit late last night. I apologize. Um, but essentially, um, we, so we stand by our report, but just the kind of the high level notes uh, that I, I'd like to bring to the attention of the group is that, 
you know, the, the police department stands ready uh, to support this effort if a decision is in fact made uh, to go ahead and, and open uh, one of these sites. What we do ask is that we're at the table. We'd like to be uh, there so that we can um, talk with uh, with the other participants so that we can per, uh, all um, plan uh, for the appropriate type of training and policy changes that the department will need um, so that our officers know how to respond appropriately and how they can act so that they can um, address both real and perceived crime uh, in and around the site. Um, we definitely think that that is, is very, very important. <clears throat> Now, um, uh, I, I, that is the end of my presentation, but we, uh, we can answer any questions that any of you all uh, may have. Um, Council Member Clark. Mr. Chairman, you're gonna be happy to hear that I can't stay much longer at this hearing. <laughs> But 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 I just want to talk for a minute with uh, Michelle because we talk all the time about a lot of different things. Yes, ma'am. Uh, of the police department. So there's been a lot of talk about um, having. Well, there's a lot of talk about the fact that a lot of the calls that our police officers have to respond to are of of a nature that is inappropriate in a way. They do it, they do their best, but they're not trained in a lot of the, um, in the social services, in psychology, in physiology, whatever. They're not trained uh, in domestic violence, etc., the way other professionals might be. And as I'm listening to this program, about how it is evolving um, in our minds in here in Baltimore. So what a lot of people say, I'm not asking you to agree to this, but what a lot of people say is we should create, uh, relieve the police of doing things that they, you know, they, they're not trained to do, but they have to do by creating some cadre of professionals that would be able to respond to emergencies because it can't just be a bunch of people in an office that you go visit. It's got to be someone 911, here we come. This program sounds not like the whole program would jump in a car and go help somebody, but that it would be a, it would really be an important component of the the of putting together a program where 911 can call for certain kinds of events will call on this cadre of people that can move fast and can more properly address uh, the kinds of uh issues that they're being assigned so I guess there's not a question buried in all this, but what, what do you think? Uh, Councilwoman, <clears throat> um, uh, as always, I enjoy our talks. Um, I'm gonna, um, if, uh, I, I'm gonna punt to Deputy Commissioner Sullivan, see if he wants to, to weigh in on that. If you don't, Deputy, you don't have to. I'm, I'm not even gonna be around to give you a hard time. <laughs> Let me see if he. Uh, I, I I don't see him. I wonder if he. All right. Well, you tell him he that. Got kicked off. Yeah. I, I just like you to think about it. Yes, ma'am. Nothing to do right now, but this. I think this is all going to happen. Uh, it won't happen without you all. Yeah. No. And and what I will say is. Um, in terms of the training piece that, that you started off with, you know, yeah. uh, through the consent decree, we are evolving into a wholly different department than what folks are used to. 
Um, do we have uh, a long way to go? Oh yeah, we do. Um, but but we definitely are embracing, you know, uh, um, the harm reduction approach, um, and we are working uh, diligently to make sure that um, that our officers are trained with certain types of skills and and certain types of ways of looking at circumstances. Um, our officers are officers, they're police officers. They are in charge of enforcement. They are not social workers or doctors or nurses, um, but they can still um, be humane. They can still um, look at their role uh, as a, a, an opportunity um, to, to help folks and, 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 like I said, reduce harm uh, where possible. Um, and so, you know, so we're definitely looking uh, to improve, to get better, uh, and, and, and be, um, be helpful, I think. And Michelle, I, I'm not going to, yeah. Oh, let, so, let, Deputy let, Commissioner oh. Sullivan just jump, jump, jumped in there. That's oh. cool. All right, it took me a second to get off mute. Uh, no, we actually, if anything, this last year has taught us is we need to reimagine what we are as a police department and what we do uh, and partner with uh, other folks to be able to provide public safety. And this is just one example of that uh, that we're gonna be moving towards. And we look forward to being able to partner. Like I said, this is not much different than an implementation of a needle exchange program for a police department. We just need to be able to develop the policies, train our officers uh, with um, if, if these sites uh, are established here in Baltimore. I would imagine uh, that you also, Deputy, are, are you visual or are you you're just being? I'm having some technical issues here today. Oh, that's so, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, we, we live with it in city government here. Um, let, let me just say that here's a bunch of people that really spend their lives um, reducing harm. Um, I, I think you and I have different versions, visions of how to have, how to deal with, how to deal with psychological, etc. mental health calls to 911, which is not the place here today to talk about. But let me just say, um, that I hear very good things about you, and I hope that you will call upon the people here today to help you do that training, even though I think in the long run, we need a core that has its own identity in terms of, of 911 and social and mental health issues, but that's for another day. But we got a lot of people here today that could really help out with, uh, with, with putting a syllabus together for the incoming officers and, and in inculcating the philosophy with officers as they are being trained, for sure. Thank you. And Mr. Pre Chairman, please pardon me and everyone else. I've got to leave. I'm, you'll be so happy to know. But I regret it because I've learned so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Chair. We're sad to see you. I do appreciate uh, all of the, the questions uh, and experience you bring. So thank you. Um, okay. Ignore the questions. Uh, we are going to move to the Baltimore City Fire Department. There anyone on? Um, Mr. Stegman, do you know if there's anyone on uh, or that needs to be elevated uh, from the fire department? Uh, let me check if anybody needs to be elevated. Um, I know the, uh, the department did send a uh, written report.
Yeah, I do apologize, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I do not see anybody from the uh, fire department, but uh, I, I'm sure that they stand by the uh, written report that they submitted to the committee. Okay, um, so I, I know I had a few questions about the report, so I, I'll send mine in writing to the fire department and would offer uh, that if the committee, members of the committee do the same, um, and we can make sure it gets in the bill file or their response in the bill file. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I, if uh, you or other members of the committee uh, would copy me on, on those uh, requests, I will make sure that we get that information to you as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so I, I think the same is true for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I think they just have a written report, um, according to my notes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, D Director Govan had uh, communicated with committee staff in advance that, that she had a conflict uh, this after uh, this morning and was not going to be able to attend. But uh, okay, again, there's a, a written report and uh, any additional questions that you have for uh, MOCJ, just please make sure you copy the government relations office and we'll make sure that we get those answers to you as soon as possible. Will do. Thank you. Um, Baltimore City Law Department. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, Hillary Ruley from the Law Department. Obviously, this particular piece of legislation before you is a resolution. So, of course, we would approve that resolution for form and legal sufficiency. Um, obviously, as everyone has noted, you have both um, uh, problems under federal and state law. Um, while that Third Circuit case that people have been discussing has given some people hope, again, we're not in the Third Circuit. It doesn't apply to us. And um, the law that the Third Circuit was interpreting um, is still a law in the books. Um, so it, it really to to take off and, and be clearly legal, you'd have to change the federal law. Um, you know, you could always also go with the approach of trying to get the federal government to agree not to enforce that law. Um, so that, that might also be possible. But again, in Maryland, um, Maryland has looked at similar legislation since 2016 in the General Assembly and has not passed it. So under Maryland law, that means it's not allowed in Maryland right now. Um, so uh, obviously you would also need the, the General Assembly to change the state law. So that's basically the background, legal background. But again, for this particular piece of legislation, it's a resolution. So obviously we would approve it for form and legal sufficiency. Okay, thank you. Uh, and that was actually the, the clarity I was looking for. Um, uh, but it's come up a few times already in the hearing that uh, we still have some more work to do with our uh, state and federal advocacy. Um, are there questions for the law department from uh, members of the committee or other council members on the line? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Uh, we are now going to move to public testimony. Uh, we have been sent a list of folks uh, who signed up to speak, but um, I'm still going to walk through the instructions for all of you. Um, if you give me one second. I had that open. Hold on. Okay, here we go. All right, so we are we are now moved to uh, testimony from the public. Uh, for those of you who have signed in using a computer uh, and we already don't have you on the list, uh, use the raise hand function to indicate that you wish to testify. Uh, we will then uh, follow the sign in uh, users uh, will be followed by people who called in. Uh, attendees who called in, uh, we do not have any way to identify you by name. So the committee staff will unmute uh, each of you one by one. Uh, you'll hear two beeps when you're unmuted. If you wish to testify, please state your name at the beginning of your testimony. If you don't, uh, just uh, say you don't wish to testify. Um, and we will go from there. Uh, so the first that we had you know, signed up in advance of the hearing, uh, was Stacy Jefferson, uh, Behavioral Health System of Baltimore. 
Hi, Mr. Chair um, and members of the committee. Um, for the record, again, I'm Stacey Jefferson. I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Community Engagement at Behavioral Health System Baltimore. I wanna first um, thank the council, um, particularly, I also wanna thank Mayor-elect um, Scott, as well as you, um, Chair Burnett, and other members of the council for your support um, and for bringing forth this important topic today. Um, Behavioral Health System Baltimore is a nonprofit organization. Um, we oversee the public system of care um, for mental health and substance use disorders in Baltimore City. Um, we are also here as a member of the Bridges Coalition um, in support of overdose prevention sites. And um, a lot of the points were made today um, that I had in my testimony, so I won't um, belabor them, but I would just like to say that the overdose prevention sites that we are proposing um, is really community and peer-led programs um, that can help save lives. And again, I cannot stress enough um, that this process is something that we are looking to really be community driven um, and to really have community input on what is needed in Baltimore City. Um, again, it has been brought up that there are studies that show that there's been um, mortality rates have dropped um, in the surrounding areas of the facilities. Um, also, you know, there's it has been found that this is can be truly a linkage um, between services um, for some of our most vulnerable. Um, and also, um, as Councilwoman Clark had um, discussed, is it can also help to divert resources and ensure that we are able to um, you, to connect people and not have to involve law enforcement or um, EMS in these responses to calls. Um, and so I just wanna end today by actually sharing my story um, because no one is exempt, unfortunately, from the tragedy of the overdose epidemic in Baltimore City. In 2015, um, my little cousin, Sean, who was just a couple months shy of his 25th birthday, had been out the night before um, partying and drinking, and he died from an opioid overdose in his home in Northeast Baltimore. His mom found him. Um, he died in his home that he shared with his mom as well as his siblings. Just two years later, in 2017, Sean's mom, my big cousin, Nika, who I was really close to, um, a day after her birthday, died from an opioid overdose. From opioids, she was prescribed by a doctor. She had taken a good portion of the box. No family should have to go through what my family had, or the hundreds of families in Baltimore City that have had lost a relative to overdose. We look at numbers a lot, um, but just know that each one of those people who lost their lives also have a family who is still here to deal with the tragedy especially when we know that there are methods that can save lives. And so again, I thank the council um, for bringing forth this very important legislation. We continue to look forward to working with you to continue to um, find and, and implement interventions that will save lives. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for sharing um, your, your personal experience. I think it's definitely important for all of us to hear um, the impact that this has had. And uh, I think it really supports um, the importance of this issue and for us to move in this direction. So thank you for all your work, work and sharing. Um, okay, next I have uh, Owen O'Keefe. And I see you already up. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you so much. My name is Owen O'Keefe. Um, I'm with Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition. I was hoping today to share some pre-recorded testimony from community members in Baltimore City. Uh, if it's possible for me to get screen share um, access, that would be fantastic. I should be fine. Uh, let's see if uh, Marjorie, one second. Yep, it seems to be working. Uh, let me see if I can get this pulled up for y'all. Um, and we'll see. Yeah, we'll see if I can get this sound. Hold on one moment. Let me know if this audio works.
No, we still yeah. issues with um, yeah, we had to get okay. it figured out. Well, I can summarize if that's all right. Um, and I have a quote written down so I can stop sharing. Um, Y'all can just look at my face. <laughs> I'll take a moment to reintroduce myself. Like I said, my name's Owen O'Keefe. I am a community outreach coordinator for Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition. And I really wanna uplift um, some community voices today of people that I spoke with uh, in preparation for this hearing who weren't able to attend and give testimony themselves. Uh, the first video I was trying to share was of Dr. Ingrid Olson, uh, who works with uh, Dr. Vicki Walters at IBR Reach. Um, she personally really believes in the power of OPS um, as another program uh, that could be added to existing uh, service providers, um, existing programming, excuse me, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the summary, uh, and, and really just speaks to um, the significance of having a variety of wraparound services all at the same place, right, where people can go and get this integrated care model um, where there is treatment available, there would be overdose prevention services, um, as well as a variety of other um, kinds of case management. I also have a video recorded from Oninye Elheri, who is a uh, case manager at Charm City Care Connection. Uh, Charm City Care Connection is a wonderful uh, place in East Baltimore where people who use drugs can have an access to a variety of services, uh, such as syringe exchange programs um, and access to housing coordination um, and a lot of other great stuff. They would be an excellent place where an overdose prevention site could theoretically be incorporated already into their model um, if it was legal for them to do so. Third person uh, I'd like to uplift is Pastor Simmons, who has been running a Baptist church um, on the corner of Pennsylvania and Cumberland Avenue uh, in uh, Penn North for about 30 years now. Uh, he speaks very seriously about how much his community could really use an overdose prevention site and how his church um, itself could serve as a place uh, where people could go to use safely, uh, where they would have access to Narcan and other services. Lastly, um, I'd like to read out a quote uh, from someone who uh, was unable to, to speak today, uh, but has a personal experience um, with the need for overdose prevention sites. Uh, this is from Janice Lynch Schuster, uh, and she wrote, these sites save money, they save what is currently wasted in the criminal justice system, and above all, they save lives. Coupled with other harm reduction measures, such a program might have saved my son's life, but I can't second guess that. I can say with assurance that they will save other lives, and they will save other parents from sitting outside on a sunny day, only to hear a police officer approach and call your name and tell you that your son has died alone in his room with illegal fentanyl in his system. I urge the city council to think of the lives they could be saving by enacting this important public health service. I urge you to see the faces of the people whose lives could be saved. These are not numbers, these are human beings. Every one of them counts. My son's life counted for more than a sign on the side of the road and a number and a CDC morbidity and mortality weekly. My son was a beautiful young man, beloved of so many people. Let us show our love to one another by offering harm reduction to every person who requests it. I appreciate your time and I appreciate your sympathy and your empathy, but more than anything, I appreciate your action and I hope that you will take it. So I'd like to end there um, with her message. I think it's really beautiful. Um, and with that, I'll say me too uh, and hope for the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you to everyone that uh, submitted that. Sorry about the tech issues. We will get that worked out for future hearings. Uh, but thank you all for uh, participating virtually. Um, and thank you, Owen, for sharing their voices uh, and for your advocacy. Um, next, we're gonna go to, to Mike Hilliard, uh, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am Mike Hilliard. I'm a member and speaker for the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. We're an organization composed of police officers, prosecutors, judges, and correctional officers advocating for the improved public safety and reform of the criminal justice system. I served the citizens of Baltimore as a member of its police department for 27 years, retiring as a major. After my service with the police department for 16 years, 
I was the community services director of the Harbell Community Organization, a nonprofit that serves Northeast Baltimore with its community services, prevention and recovery, and housing partnership programs. I wholeheartedly support overdose prevention sites for all the reasons cited by the previous speakers. But as a former police commander and a community services director, I would like to make three points. As an officer and a commander, either I or I was always concerned about my officers reaching into an arrestee's pocket and being stuck with a needle and potentially getting a communicable disease. OPSs would significantly limit this concern. Our police and fire departments are overwhelmed by 911 calls for service. OPSs would reduce these calls by limiting the number of overdoses they have to respond to. And finally, I know the members of the council have been in community meetings where they have heard complaints of used syringes being found in public settings such as playgrounds. OPSs would significantly limit this concern by allowing users a safe and secure setting to use their drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks for your advocacy. Um, and it's Neil on, Neil Franklin, also from the same partnership, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Thank you. Okay, yes. I see you now. Yes, can uh, you hear me, Chairman? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mayor uh, Scott, for allowing me to speak for a few minutes on this important issue. Um, I'm the executive director of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Mike, my good friend Mike, has already uh, given an overview of who we are and what we're about in solving uh, issues within our justice system. But a little bit about my background. I'm 34 years in, in policing in the state of Maryland, officially retired from the Maryland State Police after 23 years of service with them. And I'm sorry that uh, Councilwoman Clark had to go because here I am, needle exchange, I'm gonna mention one more time. Um, in the 1980s, I was the law enforcement representation on the board for that program as a lieutenant with the Maryland State Police. And uh, <laughs> I, I was not for the program when I was put on to that board, um, but it didn't take long for me to come around and see the benefits of that program when it came to saving lives. And here we are again with another program. Um, Four of my years, 34 years in policing, after I retired from the Maryland State Police, I was the head of training for the Baltimore Police Department. And then once I, I, I left law enforcement, I became the executive director of this fine organization. And in 2013, I had the opportunity to visit on site, which you've heard uh, spoken about many times uh, during this hearing. Um, so I went to Vancouver. I toured both the on site facility. And I think it was Susan Sherman that also mentioned, um, I mean, insight. And then I toured on site, which is the, the treatment part of the facility. And I had the opportunity to speak to a number of people uh, who were drug users who, who used the facility and to hear them speak well, so well about the facility and what it's done for changing their lives and saving their lives. I also had the opportunity to speak to many of the police officers in the area. Um, who just, again, spoke very highly of what that center had done for that particular area in, in the city of Vancouver. So I would, my advice to the Baltimore Police Department, I, I heard Michelle speak earlier, um, would be, and we could help facilitate this. Um, I know we're dealing with COVID now, but to send representation to Vancouver, to tour the facility, to speak with the police officers there, or we can bring, we can help facilitate bringing law enforcement folks from there down into Baltimore to help them to understand the benefits and to see exactly how things work, you know, what policy uh, was involved in, and so on. I know it's a different country, but there's a lot of similarities between uh, us here in the US and our law enforcement counterparts in, in Canada. 
So I'll end with, with, with this. Um, I can speak all day about this important issue and the benefits to the community. And again, reducing uh, the dramatic drain upon police services. But I think it's about time that we're really realizing that the most important system within our communities is our health system, not our justice system. That's the priority. It should be the health system. What we are doing now with this program and other efforts, what we are doing now, we're making that dramatic, much needed shift from our justice system to health. And that's what we should be doing. With this administration now in Baltimore, coming into Baltimore and what we also have in Annapolis, we have an opportunity not just to be a part of it, but to actually lead. And Baltimore needs to lead this. I, I truly believe that in my heart. I'm, you know, I, I grew up in Baltimore. I was educated in Baltimore. I'm currently a Baltimore resident. So that's what I believe. Also, that video, I mean, that visit I did in 2013, we did video that visit, and it has been shown in Annapolis on the hearings uh, a, a few times. Um, it was one time introduced by then Chairman Valerio of, of the judiciary. There's a lot of support for this in Annapolis, and we see now there's a lot of support in Baltimore. So let's lead this. Let's, let's lead the rest of the country. Uh, I think we owe it to our, our, our citizens to do so. Thank you. Agreed a thousand percent. Thank you. Um, and I'll uh, be sure to uh, let Mayor Pat Clark know you were on uh, and send your regards. Um, next, we have uh, Pastor Jim Mortor. And my, my apologies if I mis mispronounce your last name. You're elevated, just need you to unmute. You. Um, we still can't. There, there we go. I am. All right. yeah. Thank you. Did just fine. Um, thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you to Mayor Lex Scott um, for 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 bringing this forward. And um, I want to say thanks to uh, Councilwoman Clark. Um, uh, my name is uh, Jim Uratori. I'm the pastor at St. Luke's Church uh, on the Avenue in Hamden, um, and uh, Mary Pat was uh, instrumental in helping us. Uh, overcome some issues uh, when we uh, began hosting the the syringe exchange in our church um, and uh, so it's I, I I'm not gonna offer too much convincing information because I think we've heard all of that today um, from a lot of a lot of people and um, but I want to offer the the truth is that there are people in this city and that there are places in the city that are ready and waiting uh, for, um, for our, our leaders to, to move forward. Um, we have been hosting the syringe exchange for two years, uh, two and a half. And um, in our first year, when we first started really paying attention, uh, we lost 15 people. Um, and in our second year, uh, after doing the work of providing providing clean syringes and providing naloxone and, um, pre and preparing people to, uh, to take care of themselves. Um, we lost zero people in our second year. Um, this is working, harm reduction is working and uh, we're ready to, uh, to move forward. Um, our congregation is, uh, is preparing to do some upgrade in our facility so that we can expand the the offerings that we do um, so that we can uh, work with our neighbors um, and expand the relationships uh, and um, and the, the the services that are provided um, and and this is on our mind uh, OPS is on our mind to um, to be available to our community the truth of the matter is that pe that we have uh, folks in the in the alley behind their church um, and we have people behind the school and we have uh, you know folks all over the neighborhood um, who come to our church already uh, to receive these services and they have built the the comfort and the trust 
uh, in this space and in the people that, that are there to, to serve them. And, uh, and the concerns that we've had over, these, over the years of, of discarded syringes, uh, which has already been greatly di diminished, um, and the, uh, the challenges that we have um, with our, our public spaces, uh, this can only make it better. And when we consider the fact that um, that most of, of uh, most of our neighbors, are, our, our neighborhoods are insular, that they um, that folks folks who are using drugs don't necessarily go to the other neighborhoods to to to, to receive services. I know that in our neighborhood, um, the the. 50 or so people that come to our exchange on a regular basis don't go out of the neighborhood for, for, for much else. Um, and we certainly in the last two years haven't seen um, very many people from outside of the neighborhood coming in to receive uh, the services that we provide. So when we look at this uh, as, an, as, a, as a real option, we're looking at this as a real option for the neighborhoods in which they exist. Um, I, I, I know for a fact that, that, um, that our community will, um, is, is so residential in, in a sense that, that, uh, that we are focused on uh, the people that are here uh, in this place and that, are, um, and that it's possible, it is entirely manageable um, uh, for us to be to be doing with the community support, with the CBOs that are that are doing this work so well and are prepared to um, to step in and 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 lead us in this, um, I I want to um, just offer that uh, that sense that um, especially my, myself and and Pastor Simmons, our communities, our congregations, our uh, our, our neighborhoods are. Um, are here, and and we're ready, and uh, and so it's up to up to you to um, to move this along so that we can we can join uh, join in this effort um, in partnership. Um, I think that's all I can really say. Um, I, I've spoken to you before about us uh, about what we're doing, so I'm. I'm not going to go. Don't want to go too far down that 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 rabbit hole. But uh, but thank you for uh, for this work that you're doing, and uh, we look forward to uh, to seeing where uh, where this goes. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, for your continued advocacy, and I agree. Um, we, again, a lot of work ahead, uh, but uh, I think these are very important conversations to be having now. Um, all right. Uh, next, I have uh, Rachel Mahler, Open Society Policy Center. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you, Chairman Burnett and Mayor Elect Scott. Um, again, I am Rachel Mahler, and I'm here on behalf of Open Society Policy Center. Um, over the past eight months, we have been experiencing one of the most profound and uncertain moments of our lifetimes. The loss of jobs, housing, support networks, services, education, and connection to our family and friends creates an unbalanced environment and increases the risk of problematic substance use as a coping mechanism. COVID-19 impacts every single one of us, just as substance use and overdoses affect each one of us. At a time when little around us is stable, an overdose prevention site can provide the stability that the most marginalized members of our community need. Between January and June of this year in Maryland, there was a 9.1% increase in drug and alcohol related deaths with 90% 90 of the 1,326 deaths related to opioids. The Maryland Department of Health has explicitly stated that COVID-19 is responsible for the uptick. In Baltimore City, as a result, as of September, there have been 427 deaths due to opioid-related overdoses, nearly as many as the 540 deaths due to COVID-19 as of yesterday. The interconnection of these public challenges can't be understood enough, underscored enough. 
just as masks, sanitizer, and gloves are harm reduction tools to prevent the spread of COVID-19, overdose prevention sites curb the transmission of HIV, hepatitis, other illnesses and diseases, and most importantly, prevent deaths. The dis distribution of clean, sterile equipment and quick access to medical personnel are critical and life-saving. Our March 26, 2020, supervised consumption and overdose prevention services were listed as essential services in British Columbia during COVID-19 pandemic. Essential services. Ironically, today, November 24th, the mayor of Vancouver, Mayor Kennedy Stewart, is introducing a motion to the city council to request that the federal government decriminalize possession of small amounts of illicit drugs, stating that it is an urgent and necessary next step. It would be incredible if this council could stride in step with cities like Vancouver that are showing how harm reduction for substance use decreases risks related to other public health crises. The Open Society Policy, Policy Center strongly urges the Baltimore City Council to move forward with the approval of overdose prevention sites. Other countries with overdose prevention sites have taken their own steps to remain accessible to those who need them during COVID-19. In Zurich, a tent was erected outside for drug users to access. Copenhagen and France stopped their mobile sites but kept open the standalone locations. In Portugal, the mobile site was integrated into emergency response and positioned near homeless shelters. And in Barcelona, there was a separate lockdown center specifically for persons who use drugs. You may remember last January when the Open Society Institute Baltimore hosted three individuals from around the world to share data, facts, knowledge, and insight about the respective overdose prevention sites that they worked with. Metaneris in Barcelona sticks with me in particular because of its unique yet critical model. It is a collective of approximately 250 women and gender non-conforming people who have access to clean clothes, laundry services, and spaces to store personal belongings. People are able to receive all sorts of support, including somatic and social health services, occupational training, participation in community activities, using the internet and phone, receiving counseling, and it is an overdose prevention site. Often women in the LGBTQIA identifying individuals struggle to find services that are welcoming, safe, and created specifically for them especially if they use drugs. While each site around the world is different and unique, they are all important and necessary. Every delay in doing what public health experts are telling us is necessary puts another person's life in jeopardy. Overdose prevention sites are the bridge to connecting with those who need support and resources but are unable to receive them through conventional providers. This is about saving lives. At a time when all of our choices are about saving the lives of those around us, be bold enough to save every single life. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you for your advocacy. I think it's something that um, we, uh, the, the, the decriminalization and ending the war on drugs uh, I definitely think that that's something that this council will be looking to take up in the coming term, um, having spoken to a few other members. So I'd say stay tuned and we'll see what we can get done. Um, so next we have, I have Tamika Spellman, uh, HIPS DC. Hi there. Uh, yes, yeah, she had Tamika had to leave, but uh, but there's other other hips folks who can speak in her stead who were actually set up to go later, but they can. Um, I think Jessica. Hi. Yes. Sorry. Um, Director Salman had to leave, so she yielded her time to me. Hello, everyone. Uh, my yes, name is Jessica. Jessica your your sound is coming in. Um, it may be like a Bluetooth connection is not well. Oh, um, how about, about now? Perfect. Yeah, my headphones. Better. Here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, hi everyone. My name is Jessica Kieralisa Martinez. I am HIPS's methamphetamine services specialist, and I work in harm reduction. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak today, 
And I would like to begin by noting the importance of gender in syringe service programs and how an OPS could expand the gender gap in drug use uh, services. This year in August, a Kentucky SSP reported in rural Appalachia that 137 participants in a study out of 234 were male. They go on to say participants were predominantly white and only 42% were women. The fact that a rural sampling had 60% of participants identify as male is no coincidence. In 2012, NASAD published guidelines for local state and health departments to implement SSPs and found that demographics leans towards serving a male population. In fact, men were twice as likely to inject drugs com as compared to women. Recently, in January of this year, the National Drug Institute on Abuse, I'm sorry, the National Institute on Drug Abuse published a report titled Substance Use in Women, where they stated men are more likely than women to use almost all types of illicit drugs, and illicit drug use is more likely to result in emergency department visits or overdose deaths in men than women. Not only this, but they reported women who use opiates when compared to men are likely to use smaller amounts and for a shorter time and less likely to inject the drug. Just this past year, HIPS exchanged close to 640,000 syringes with nearly 80% of our clients being male. Not just male, but as a matter of fact, cis male. This wasn't always the case as HIPS in its inception served as a predominantly female sex worker population during our outreach. And between 1997 to 2006, HIPS primarily focused on serving stimulant users and sex workers would use stimulants to carry out long nights. HIPS like BHRC used to pass out safer smoking kits, but legal enforcement uh, caused us to not be able to hand them out anymore in DC. And when Prevention Works closed in February 2011, HIPS became the primary syringe service provider. So what makes an OPS different than an SSP? Well, for starters, it caters to a more diverse audience, a larger breadth of drug users. OPS is across the globe and most notably across the border in Canada have supervised smoking areas that are well ventilated, meaning that medical personnel are able to supervise not only injection drug users, but as well as individuals who smoke drugs. This means that people who use drugs in different ways are able to get connected to the same harm reduction services, treatment, and even abstinence uh, support groups or care if they choose. Simulant users have been left out of the conversation nationally for a long time, and I had the privilege in 2019 of starting HIPS's methamphetamine services program. Some of my first observations were that most of my clients were male. Initially, in my first year, actually, over 90% of the syringe exchanges that I engaged in were with male clients. Um, many people disclosed to me that they never thought that someone like me would exist. And I want to highlight that when President Barack Obama signed the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which uh, began in 2016, it allowed HHS funds to be transferred to the implementation of syringe service programs, as well as um, starting uh, distributing syringes with federal funding. And for my clients, they're not met with naloxone or Narcan if they overdose. They're not met with MAT services. It's actually very stigmatized for stimulant users and they have very few options. And OPS would give stimulant users options. It would allow them to be able to engage with doctors and medical personnel and talk about their drug use in a more important way that is not available currently. And I want to just highlight it with the rest of my time, the Portuguese model of decriminalizing drug use, um, which happened in 2001. In 1999, 369 people died of overdoses in Portugal. But when they decriminalized drugs in 2016, only 30 people died of, of drug overdoses. And overall, in the age group of 15 to 24, the most at-risk group of using drugs, people started to use less. A point that some people try to use about Portugal is that overall, um, some lifetime drug use increased from 7.8% to 12%. I do wanna note the type of drugs that increased. So let's look at the facts. 
Lifetime cannabis use increased from 7.6% to 11.7%. And cocaine use went from 0.9% to 1.9%, ecstasy 0.7% to 1.3%, and heroin from 0.7% to 1.1%. Overall, that 4% increase in lifetime drug use was for cannabis use, uh, which is considered an illicit drug in Portugal. So overall, the existence of an OPS, a safe space for people to use drugs, as also noted in Portugal, people who smoke drugs wanted a safe space to use drugs and having well-ventilated areas actually decreased public use of drugs and overdoses overall because persons were allowed to immediately intervene. Um, we also need to take into consideration the fact that is allow that space because drugs are able to be used in that sanctuary space and decriminalizing paraphernalia and drug use and the inclusion of an OPS overall will reduce overdose deaths and save lives. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be available, but um, you can also email me at jessica at Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Gerardo uh, Benavides, I'm sorry again if I mispronounced anyone's name, uh, Youth Empowered Society. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Councilman Burnett. Um, my name is Gerardo Benavides, so it was a little bit mispronounced, but it's okay. Um, okay. No, you're all good. Um, thank you and thank you to the members of this committee, um, to Council President Scott and to everyone who's already spoken, who's scheduled to speak in support of this. Uh, just very important informational hearing. Um, so again, my name is Gerardo Benavides. I am the housing program coordinator at Youth Empowered Society, so better known as the Yes Drop-In Center. Um, we are currently the city's only drop-in center for youth experiencing homelessness founded by formerly homeless youth and allies working to end homelessness through direct service provision, youth leadership, and engaging in, sy in systems level reform. Um, we work with youth ages 14 to 25 by, again, providing them with services to sustainably grow in a dignified, supportive, and safe space. And our incredible team provides, in a very broad sense, you know, drop-in services, case management, employment services and important job training, um, connections to educational programs, housing connections, and other leadership and advocacy opportunities. Um, YES is also an overdose response program. Um, we became an ORP through the Maryland State Department of Health, which allows us to distribute naloxone to our youth and to folks in their networks, um, a critical tool and intervention in the treating of substance use, drug use as a public health issue. Um, overdose prevention sites are an extension of this harm reduction movement and one that is, again, rooted in social justice and dignity. At, at YES, we, we, we do fundamentally believe in harm reduction and trauma-informed care practices um, as core principles rooted, at least at YES, in the self-sanctuary model. Um, we strive to carry this in our work in order to make YES a safe and accessible and dignified for the youth we work with, um, and a special emphasis on youth that we work with, that we collaborate with, um, you know, not just serve, working with them, um, led by Youth Voice. Um, overdose prevention sites are physical and figurative testaments to how harm reduction and trauma-informed care can work. You know, they allow for people to safely use substances in a safe and supportive environment where they can get connected to services that they need to. Overdose prevention sites can be also integrated into some existing services, um, you know, expanding the possibilities for how to best get those services to the people who most need them. Um, there are proven, effective, safe, and cost-effective service, one rooted in treating the racist war on drugs as a systems-level public health issue rather than shifting the blame of drug use from society to the individual. Um, and again, it's a socially just intervention. Uh, most importantly, overdose prevention sites are established safe spaces um, that are not centered on stripping the dignity away from the people who use. Um, on the contrary, overdose prevention sites allow for people who use to lead dignified and healthy lives. At, at YES, um, in the summer of 2019, we, we had several youth pass away from overdose. Um, the loss of life to overdose was and, and still is like very traumatizing. 
Um, those loved ones we've lost to overdose are, are not forgotten. Um, and we think and imagine like how different would our drop-in center be? How different would our city be if there were established sites where people who had access to life-saving tools um, could go? Um, how different would things be if they had access to dignified treatment to respectful practitioners who could support them before, during, and after use? Um, you know, this isn't just like a conceptual dream or a theoretical afterthought. You know, there are very real consequences, dangerous consequences, traumatizing consequences around what happens when individuals use without those supports, um, without the presence of overdose prevention tools like naloxone, and without the presence of people committed to acknowledging that all human life is valuable. Um, I just want to end with saying that there are literal lives at stake, um, and overdose prevention sites can save lives. Um, and at the very least, that should be enough to turn this idea um, into a tangible and influential reality. So thank you all um, again, and I look forward to hearing from some of the other speakers and um, to seeing where this movement goes and grows. Thank you, um, and I, me as well. Uh, Next, I have, uh, and again, sorry if I not get names right here. There's no pronunciation uh, guidance. Um, I have Amy Hetch Sizes, um, Baltimore Psychedelic Society. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, okay. I don't think my camera's working, unfortunately. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, I'm Amy Hecht-Sizes, she, her, with the Baltimore Psychedelic Society. We are an open community in Baltimore and the DMV that supports the emergence of psychedelics, plant medicines, and altered states as agents of transformation and healing. We've been a community group since 2016, and before COVID, we hosted events, talks, film screenings like Fantastic Fungi, panel discussions, meetups, monthly integration circles, and we've been a member of Bridges for over a year and a half. We hope to help reduce stigma around all drug use, around drug exceptionalism, the idea that some drugs and some experiences are better than others. Um, I want to briefly name that we're a couple miles from the new multi-million dollar Johns Hopkins Psychedelic Research Center. DC just decriminalized plants uh, and mushrooms, um, entheogens, that's happening in other parts of the US. These, dr these drugs are becoming super popular, normalized, mainstreamed, and commercialized. And all this is happening while other people using other drugs are overdosing and dying at a higher rate than ever. My hope is that those advancements don't distract from this conversation. Um, and I wanna echo Ricky Morris's early message in the beginning of this that we're all connected. And I just want to say this is the most important conversation we could be having right now. And I want to urge people from my community listening to shift their focus to overdose prevention and harm reduction. Um, real healing and safety and survival and the ability for people to advance and thrive starts here. Um, and now I'm really honored to read the testimony from someone I co-organize with who is working and couldn't be here right now, um, my dear friend, uh, Stephanie Colgrove. Baltimore City Council. My name is Stephanie Colgrove and I am writing in support of overdose prevention sites, which would provide a place for individuals to seek harm reduction information, linkage to treatment, and virtually eliminate the risk of death from overdose. I have a master's degree in social work and I am a therapist providing dual diagnosis treatment at the University of Maryland Medical System in Baltimore City. I am 33, married with a six month old daughter and I own a home in Catonsville. I am also a person in long-term recovery from opioid addiction. IV drug use is risky and using in secrecy can be deadly. This secrecy feels necessary when you are struggling with shame and stigma. There is so much available when you want to stop using, but there is hardly any care or attention while you are still struggling. I feel lucky every day that fentanyl wasn't in, her in the heroin supply at the time while I was using. It is likely I would be dead had I been using the heroin of today. The only people I told about my addiction 
were judgmental and harsh, which drove me to isolate more. I wanted help, but I wasn't offered treatment until I became wrapped up in the penal system, which only added to my stress and prolonged the timeline of my addiction. There needs to be a place where a person with drug problems can feel cared for and seen, even while they continue to use. As a mental health professional and as a person with a history of IV drug use, I possess a unique perspective on this issue. I urge you to support overdose prevention sites to save the lives of Baltimore residents and their families. Thank you. Um, okay, next we have, uh, same on camera already, uh, Amos Irwin. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate, well, everyone coming out and the, the council members for, uh, you know, making this happen and making time for this issue. As so many people have already said today, uh, this issue is personal, so I'm Amos Irwin, the program director of Law Enforcement Partnership, and uh, we, we lost one of our colleagues uh, to overdose this past year. Um, we've also already mentioned the real, just tragic loss of Will Miller Sr., um, just, you know, a leader in, in Baltimore who's already spoken to so many of you about this issue himself personally. Um, and, you know, the leader of the coalition working for uh, overdose prevention sites in Boston uh, was uh, also tragically passed away uh, last year. It's just, this is relentless and it is so urgent that we act now and not wait until, uh, you know, every, wait until other, you know, other people take the first step. We really need to, need to act. Um, I wanted to mention just a couple of quick things since so much has already been covered. Um, I was proud to work with uh, Dr. Susan Sherman on the cost benefit analysis of a, an overdose prevention site in Baltimore. And I just wanted to highlight that, you know, in addition to the tremendous cost savings that we estimated of, you know, $6 million savings from a single, you know, just one facility that has, you know, 12 booths, um, we would all, there, there are specific savings where it's, you know, four HIV in, infections and 21 hepatitis C infections and 374 days in the hospital for skin and soft tissue infection. Um, in addition to about, uh, you know, six overdose deaths prevented, uh, 100 overdose related ambulance calls and 78 emergency room visits and 27 hospitalizations. Um, those are just, you know, this is just from one facility. Um, and we certainly hope that, you know, more than one facility would be established. Uh, but just from one facility, it's just, you know, a transformation in terms of the health uh, and, and safety of, of the population. Uh, and, it, and in addition, that, you know, we estimate around 120 additional people would uh, enter into recovery services as a result of these facilities because there's such a tremendous impact of building relationships with staff in the facility for people who currently often do not have a lot of constructive relationships in their life. Um, this is just a, a transformational intervention. Um, I also wanted to mention I'm, I'm proud to work with the Bridges Coalition on engaging community associations uh, to raise awareness about harm reduction and about overdose prevention sites uh, in particular. And we really take it seriously as our responsibility to work on, uh, you know, having conversations with people, letting people know who we are and, uh, you know, sharing the, the information that we have and, and, you know, really getting to know the priorities of individual community associations so that it's a work that's taking place at the neighborhood level in Baltimore to build some of the support that, that Dr. Sherman showed is already out there to make, to build that even, uh, even higher in Baltimore city. So again, thank you so much for, for taking this issue on and, and for, you know, moving swiftly on it. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for your advocacy. Um, 
Next, I have uh, Andrews uh, Santo, uh, DC's uh, Dance Safe. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Ah, all right, excellent. Uh, Andrew Santos, and thank you guys all so much for having us on. We really, I really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Uh, I represent DC Dance Safe, and I just wanted to quickly go over some uh, facts and figures from published studies based on some of the uh, overdose prevention sites throughout the world. Uh, the first site was actually in Bern, Switzerland in 1986. So this is actually a phenomenon that has been going on for quite a long time. Um, Denmark's first overdose prevention site was opened in Copenhagen in 2012. A 2014 study found that three quarters of participants reported reductions in, in just that injection risk behaviors such as injecting in a less rushed manner 63 percent fewer outdoor injections 56 percent no longer sharing needles uh, 53 percent and cleaning their injection sites better and more often 43 percent um, a study done in king's cross sydney in australia found that rates of robbery, theft, and drug dealing did not increase at all in the nine years after their major uh, oper uh, object uh, overdose prevention site, uh, MSIC, was opened. They found that rates of robbery and theft actually fell dramatically in those neighborhoods. Uh, very interestingly, uh, another fact from that particular site found that 70% of people who went there reported they had never been to a, a local health facility to help with treatment or uh, just any sort of health issues around their usage. That 70% of people who had never used, who had never gotten help before that were now in a place that was giving them access to mental health treatment, physical health treatment, doctors, and even preventative care in some cases. Uh, there is a cost benefit analysis done in San Francisco for a hypothetical OBS, which concluded that each dollar spent on the site would result in at least two dollars in savings uh, for an annual of about three and a half million for a single site. And of course, San Francisco is pretty big and was looking at doing a number of sites, which would have been a lot of money they would have saved. Uh, there's actually a long-term five-year study that was done on an unsanctioned OPS here in the United States. Um, that similar to all other OPSs, there were no deaths. Uh, there were, in fact, no 911 calls even. The only 33 overdoses that they had in over 10 and a half thousand injections over five years, all 33 were rescued with Narcan, no need for ambulances, no need for hospital time. Uh, you know, that's even in an unsanctioned one here in the United States, we're seeing, again, the same positive results that we're seeing all over the world. Um, another study on that actual site found that over its first two years, 67% of its users had reported disposing of needles unsafely in the previous month. Uh, they found that, that that in and of itself was 1,725 public disposals of syringes that they stopped in those first two years. Uh, in 2014, a analysis review of 75 different studies across the world found that, quote, SISs, which safe injection sites was the terminology they were using at the time, were efficacious in attracting the most marginalized people who use drugs, promoting safer injection conditions, enhancing access to primary health care, and reducing the overdose frequency. SISs were not found to increase drug injecting, drug trafficking, or crime in the surrounding environments, and SISs were found to be associated with reduced levels of public drug injections and dropped syringes. And a fairly recent 2020 report, uh, which came out just earlier this month, went over uh, a number of studies throughout the world, finding that OPSs have, re have never resulted in a death, which we've been over, have 
resulted in reduced ambulance calls for opioid-related ODs in Sydney, 68%, reduced injection risk behaviors from studies in Vancouver, Denmark, and Germany and Spain, uh, 80% re 80% reductions of re rushed injections, 71% less outdoor injections, 56% less unsafe syringe disposal, and 37% less used syringe reuse. And three combined European studies found a 69% reduction in syringe sharing. Uh, and this is, this is just a, a small fragment of the wealth of data that's out there. Uh, there have been so many studies done on so many different sites throughout the world. And that just goes to really show that the uh, reports that have been mentioned already today that were done in Baltimore, the cost benefit analysis and the ABLE Foundation report on the feasibility of establishing one are really sound and there's no reason to believe that Baltimore wouldn't be saving at least six million dollars a year and reducing overdose deaths, infections, ambulance calls, hospitalizations, and getting more people into treatment, which is really the most important thing. And also go to show that we can do this without increasing crime or drug use or drug trafficking or harm to the community in any way. Uh, overall, this, this is really just a, a super positive thing that we can do to help not only drug users, not only their communities, but also the cities and the states as well. So it's definitely something that I'm glad you guys have taken the time to look into and are considering and are listening to what's going on out there. So thank you very much for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Um, and Next, we have uh, Shane Sullivan. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Hello. Um, my name is Shane Sullivan. I'm a community outreach specialist with HIPS in Washington, DC. Um, I have also been a DMV resident for my entire life. HIPS is a proud member of the Bridges Coalition, um, and so I'm here on behalf of HIPS to echo the support of others have already expressed for establishing um, OPSs in Baltimore. We've all witnessed COVID amplify existing social and health in inequities in our system. In April of this year alone, 47 DC residents died from overdose, which is a monthly rate that's been unseen since 2016 when fentanyl became the predominant adulterant in street heroin. Um, just for some context, much like Baltimore, um, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in DC found that fentanyl was involved in 20% of overdose fatalities in the district in 2015. Um, in 2020, that number has, dropped, has jumped to 94%. Um, so when it comes to the social landscape of drug use, DC follows Baltimore trends um, in terms of use and in terms of the street and drug supply market. Um, like Baltimore and DC was already in an overdose crisis prior to COVID and we're on track for a 20% increase in, in fatalities from last year. Um, this is despite the city purchasing 66,000 naloxone kits in 2019 after years of shortages of the medication. Um, just to provide some sense of scope of how many kits that is, that's enough naloxone for nearly one in every 10 DC residents. Um, so that expansion of naloxone access was a really important step towards sound public health policy um, naloxone is a vital life-saving medication, but only wait when it can actually be used. It's very difficult to use in high-risk settings like public restrooms and alleyways, and it's impossible to use when you're alone. Um, I've been an outreach worker and harm reductionist for seven years, and the gap in services that safe consumption spaces fill has been apparent to me since day one. Homeless encampments that our outreach staff regularly visit become de facto overdose prevention sites when such sites aren't legally sanctioned. Many DC encampments are already blanketed with naloxone to such a degree that even folks who don't live in those spaces will visit them in order to use, knowing that somebody will be on site to administer naloxone if they do overdose. So we know from models like Insight in Vancouver that OPS, OPS sites don't increase drug use. They simply provide a space for people who use drugs to do so safely and with ongoing care beyond just using. 
Um, my job is a privilege to be able to work with our clients. We have thousands of unique interactions on the streets of DC every year. And often we're the first connection um, or a care, like point of care linkage to broader health services for residents. Um, but what doesn't feel good about my job is knowing that regardless of whether we provide referrals to HIPS's drop-in center or other resources, that follow-up care doesn't include a space for clients to use the supplies that we just provided them. As somebody who's been in community with people who use drugs for a long time, overdose prevention sites are, to me, basic healthcare. It's our stigma rooted in a shameful legacy of criminalization particularly of poor communities of color that obscures that reality. Not everybody who uses drugs will utilize uh, OPSs, but they will most greatly benefit those most vulnerable to overdose due to racism, classism, housing instability, and lack of access to quality healthcare. They will also greatly benefit those who currently use alone, many of whom lack community support or feel too stigmatized in their use to reach out for help. One of those people who felt too ashamed to rely on her community was Kelsey Blair Paulus, she grew up in Baltimore County and fatally overdosed in DC on April 6, 2019 at the age of 29. She was my childhood friend who remained one of my closest friends until her death. We were like siblings. I'd given her naloxone and provided other forms of support around her drug use previously, but the night that she died, she told me that she felt too ashamed to have friends caring for her. Despite living 10 minutes away, she refused to let me be there in person to help her use safely. She had been on Suboxone previously, but wasn't ready to stop using fully because of her history of medication-assisted treatment and her desire, as she put it, to stop burdening her friends, I believe she would have benefited from the presence of overdose prevention sites. The message that she had received from the world, as with so many people who use drugs, was that her life had no value. Overdose prevention sites do not send a message to the community that we promote drug use. They send a message that we love and care about people who use drugs and that no one deserves to die a preventable death. All of us working in harm reduction have been impacted by drug use and overdose in some way, shape, or form. And our connection to this issue is often deeply personal. Even when it wasn't before for some of us, the proliferation of fentanyl in the street drug supply these last five years has led to an unprecedented increase in overdose deaths that has caused indescribable loss, including the deaths of clients, friends, family, fe fellow harm reductionists, and other loved ones. Addressing this growing crisis requires progressive evidence-based solutions, of which OPSs are an essential pillar. I'm really grateful to be at this hearing. Um, I'm really grateful for the advocacy of everybody in the Bridges Coalition, um, in particular BHRC, and for everyone who's devoted so much of their lives to fighting for health justice, um, which starts with OPSs. And I'm hopeful that Baltimore can set the model for the region and establishing Maryland's first overdose prevention site. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your time and for your advocacy. Um, next. Uh, at Greg Freely, uh, North Avenue Mission and Red Shed Village. Hi, Councilman. Yeah, Greg Freely and William Miller Jr. are not present, so we can, um, I think there's one, one person with a hand up, and then Candy would love to go last after anybody with their hand up, if that's possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, is... Perry, uh, Perry Hopkins? No, okay. Yeah, Perry's also not here, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Candy Kerr? Um, I think she said she wanted to go last. Oh, okay, so go to the person with the hand raised first, okay. Um, I see, all right, so there's two with their hands up. Uh, Kim Wireman, let's go there. I'm here. Okay, we can yes, hear you. Yes, I'm here. Great. Here, let me turn my camera on. All right. Um, I'm Kim Wireman. I'm president of Pal Recovery Center. We're a nonprofit treatment agency at 14 South Broadway. Thank you, Councilman Burnett and Mayor Alex Scott, and all those who sponsored this hearing. We're very grateful uh, for the opportunity to testify. Pal, require, uh, Pal Recovery provides treatment on a walk in basis to public health clients and we mainly treat fentanyl dependence. Our outreach staff go out daily to the back alleys and abandoned houses across the city where people are in need or dying. We try to help them get into treatment. The staff bring these, these people in every day and even people who are experiencing such suffering can't be expected to approach treatment perfectly. 
Our clients need a system that includes overdose prevention sites and harm reduction in order to keep them engaged and alive and engaged in help. Prior to the COVID epidemic, with more people on the streets, our community staff regularly saved approximately 10 lives a month by administering Narcan to overdose victims on the sidewalks and in the alleys of our immediate community who were in the last few minutes of life. We need a system to help all of those in need with a variety of immediate and engaging means, especially overdose prevention sites. Power Recovery Center strongly supports the addition of overdose prevention sites in Baltimore to save the lives of thousands and thousands who otherwise might die from opioid overdose in the city. The sites in Europe and Vancouver can provide evidence of the lives we would save and the resources across the city that could be used in new ways to help ease the opiate crisis. As an example, Powell alone, by more efficiently using medical staff between 2014 and 2016, saved $730,000 in public health dollars by eliminating unnecessary ER use. An overdose prevention system in our city could do this and so much more. It would save hundreds and hundreds of lives each year and free people and resources across our city to participate in new, more effective solutions. We strongly support opioid overdose, overdose prevention sites in Baltimore. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next person I have uh, with their hand raised is uh, Andrew Bell. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I won't take up a lot of time. I know folks have uh, tread over all the ground of uh, research and evidence or a, a lot of it. I wanna thank the council and the chairman for making space for this topic. I wanna recognize the work that Bridges has done over years and years uh, to elevate this topic. Um, I, as a ignorant college kid uh, in 2008, um, worked uh, at, uh, went to do something useful, uh, figure out my city better and, and uh, figure out what's next. Uh, I come from Vancouver, Canada. I worked two and a half years of nights at Insight and then three years managing a low barrier homeless shelter um, for the same organization. Um, although I thought that I'd gone there with an open mind, uh, I still thought that uh, as I got led into people's stories, uh, I would find out when door number one instead of door number two was chosen and how a succession of those choices led to where I met folks. Uh, and instead, I found out that folks were doing better with the cards they were dealt than I would do with those same cards uh, without exception. Um, one client uh, whose experience I think is instructive um, is a, a construction worker named Arun, who had a, a braided goatee, uh, came in and I was the front desk staff who ended up signing him up. Uh, a few days later, we got to talking and he talked about how his job and his habit had become difficult to hold down at the same time. Um, but coming to Insight meant that he could get out of the shame and isolation um, that didn't allow him to seek help. Um, he was able to get help through Insight and we never saw him again. Uh, I came to the United States in 2014, around when fentanyl hit uh, the downtown east side in Vancouver, as well as Washington and Baltimore. I'm grateful to have been able to work uh, at HIPS for a couple of years and want to recognize my colleagues who are on the line here. Um, I'm going to share two articles in the chat box, uh, which is a national uh, journalism award, a national magazine award winning piece on the downtown east side and a post investigation uh, two years later uh, on D.C. Um, when I would look uh, and talk to and scroll Twitter about friends back home when fentanyl hit the downtown east side, it was like the sky was on fire. Um, the homeless shelter that I had managed would get two overdoses a month. It was getting two every shift. Um, we would be able to reverse those overdoses, but this was a qualitative change uh, in the drug supply. Um, and the response uh, in D.C. where I lived and worked um, was uh, deafeningly silent. Um, who was dying um, uh, were African-American men in the baby boom generation, uh, primarily as a demographic, and there was no political cost to their death. Um, I, uh, when I met Will Sr., uh, he told me that um, this had been happening in his community for decades. If you look at the numbers, we all uh, associate West Virginia with the opioid crisis. Uh, in 1999, West Virginia had about uh, 2.3 deaths per 100,000 related to an opioid overdose. Uh, Baltimore City had roughly 50. Uh, West Virginia is the worst hit state in the union in uh, the height of our crisis, around 50 deaths per 100,000, the same amount that Baltimore City was seeing 20 years ago with none of the compassion or urgency or resources. 
Um, that anger is something I've heard from residents sometimes uh, wondering why it is now a problem. Um, and as the truism goes, when there is uh, rain in the white community, there's a, a flood in the black community. Um, today, Baltimore City's overdose rates are over 100 um, uh, per 100,000, roughly double the worst hit state in the union. Um, I want to thank again the council. Um, the thing that I'm most grateful for um, in terms of being, being able to work um, with people who use drugs in the, in the space that was fought for by them and the women who, sh who founded strong organizations like the Portland Hotel Society and supported the founding of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users um, helped me deconstruct some of uh, the prejudice that I had absorbed um, through the paradigms that hold sway in our society. Um, one of the gifts of that deconstruction was my friendship with Will senior um, who uh, was uh, my closest friend in this city. Um, and when uh, I hadn't heard from him um, after speaking to him on the night of October 6th, um, uh, by the middle of the day, uh, I started to worry a um, uh, number of phone calls, um, conversations with other friends who also happened to be looking for him, um, ended up uh, 8 p.m. with uh, the fire department um, going through his door uh, and us finding him there. Uh, he'd been in a more uh, stable place than I'd ever known him to be, um, and then his family had known him to be. And amidst COVID, if I have a bad day, I uh, nap uh, or binge watch TV shows uh, or do things that aren't dangerous. Um, and uh, that has everything to do with privilege and insulation um, and, uh, and uh, things that have nothing to do with um, with me a few weeks before Will died, he talked about um, his upbringing. Um, and uh, Will is um, one of the uh, strongest uh, people I've ever known, someone who's high up in state government who I spoke to yesterday, who developed a relationship with him, talked about the light that drew you towards him. Um, he was introduced to heroin when he was uh, 12 years old uh, and uh, his brother was murdered um, before he was 16, uh, when we were walking to Communities United, where he worked uh, on the one leg that he had, um, where he would never, um, never waver in his balance. Um, he talked about he him, him starting using heroin um, for his own fault and decisions that he made. And I looked at him and I didn't argue, but I thought that I didn't use heroin, um, uh, not as a result of decisions that I uh, made or anything, uh, uh, yeah, anything that I'd done. Um, when, um, when Will passed, um, he was in uh, one of the most dangerous uh, places, which is when your tolerance has gone down um, and the street drug supply is um, toxically proliferated with fentanyl. Um, and uh, even in his advocacy and in his leadership, there was still um, the stigma that holds sway that didn't allow him to talk to me or other friends uh, about um, what he was going to do uh, because he was having a hard time. And uh, let's face it, we've all been having a hard time in 2020. Um, the numbers are significantly up uh, in this city. And um, as a state, as a society, we have uh, been an abject failure in terms of including the voices of people who use drugs. Um, and when the street drug supply changed from uh, prescription pills uh, nationally as a driver of overdose to heroin, to fentanyl, to stimulants, and now uh, to the um, manifold impacts of COVID. Um, when uh, fentanyl hit the downtown east side, people knew the next day. Uh, if you read the post investigation, um, you'll get a angry email from me as a service provider um, talking about how our clients were dying now and the naloxone uh, that one prescriber in the district was providing um, when the overdose crisis started was not sufficient and neither was the belated program by the health department. Taking up enough of your time, uh, I thank you for the time. Uh, I thank you for all those that keep um, bringing uh, attention to this issue. Um, and uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for making space for us today. Thank you. Um, and last I have, uh, and sorry, I missed the notes <laughs> coming into me. Uh, last person up is uh, Candy Kerr. Woo, hey y'all, uh, thanks for being here. Um, I know that we're like three hours in and I don't know how many people we've lost. Uh, I don't particularly, like I really appreciate your time, but I'm gonna ask everybody to take a deep breath um, because everything that was just, everything that just said. <laughs> Councilperson Burnett, you can do a better, 
You can do a better deep breath than that. I saw that. Uh, all the information that was just given was a lot of information um, from a lot of different people that uh, really love and care about this issue. And I know that y'all hear about stuff all day, every day that people really care about. Um, and I'm not really going to tell you anything that you haven't heard already, right? Like if you need, um, if you need any more info about this stuff, you can reach out to anybody that was on this call, anybody from the Bridges Coalition, like Reginie said, there's about 27, 28, like different, uh, coalition members. So you can reach out to all those people. Um, you know, what I'll say is that, uh, you know, the first, uh, Pastor Jim talked about people being behind his church in Hamden, um, like nodding out. Um, and that was the first time in my life that I had ever seen somebody um, on heroin was I worked on the Avenue in Hamden and there was a woman behind the store that I was working on the same street that uh, um, St. Luke's is on. Um, that same back street, a woman that was uh, nodding out to the point of like hunched completely over. And I had never seen that before and I didn't know what was happening. And I was really scared for her. And I cried and I called my parents and I was like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what this is. Um, and I was informed that, uh, that that is what can happen when somebody is using um, heroin. And that was eight, nine, 10 years ago. Same street this, that St. Luke's is on same street 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, since then my education has furthered, I've learned a lot of stuff about, about uh, substance use, about recovery in all forms, about harm reduction. Um, I also moved from Hamden to Mount Vernon and have seen people, seen people nodding out here. I've seen people uh, that need naloxone in this space. I've seen it in Penn North. I've seen it in Hamden. I've seen it in the Black Butterfly. I've seen it in the White L. It is all around the city. Um, and the thing about it is that, uh, you know, this, we're asking for overdose prevention sites and the stuff's already happening. Um, this stuff is happening below ground. Um, and I'm glad that that's happening because it's still saving lives. Um, why I want this to be an above ground situation is because I want to save more lives. I want people to have more access to the things that they need to save their lives, not just naloxone um, and not just syringes, but uh, people like the people that are on this call that have testified that uh, care about their lives and care about them. Um, I'm aware of all the like state and federal law needs and like, you know, there's a lot of hope going on in this call, a lot of like, a lot of love for this idea. Um, and it was like a little dampened with the like, you know, state and federal laws got to have that happen. Um, and the fact that like safe house stuff like doesn't apply to us because we're in Baltimore. And I just want to say that uh, even if that if the safe house like the safe house ruling from Philly doesn't uh, apply to us on paper, it still matters. Every move that happens in the harm reduction world and in harm reduction in the United States of America matters because the safe house, like that ruling is another, another push to the door to open this up for not just Philly, not just Baltimore, not just uh, San Francisco, but every space in the United States that needs an overdose prevention site. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Every move that is made um, in harm reduction in the United States matters, even if it doesn't affect us on paper. Um, and, you know, I think the, the last thing that I'll say is, like, I don't really know what y'all's next move is. Like, I know this is just an informational hearing and, like, our job was, like, literally to come here and to, to give you info and let you know, like, what this looks like, what it could look like here. Um, and so I don't really know what the next move is, but I'm asking you to take the next move. Um, and I'm asking you to take the next move for the broader movement, right? The broader movement in the United States. Like I said, like, just because Safe House, like, doesn't technically, the ruling, like, doesn't technically apply to Baltimore City, that's still a step forward. And I'm asking you guys to make the next step forward for the United States. And then beyond the United States, I'm asking you to do it for the citizens of Maryland, right? Like, I know that 
I know that we are Baltimore City, but like making this move for Maryland can for Baltimore City can move this forward for Maryland because it's not just the cities that this stuff is happening, right? The racist war on drugs affects people of color, black people specifically, but uh, this war has morphed into this opioid crisis, right? That black people have been experiencing for decades, as was mentioned, but it's also affecting the rural communities of of Maryland, right? Um, and so, like, I'm asking you to take whatever move you need to move for, you need to do for those people. I'm also asking you to do it for the members that we have lost of the Bridges Coalition, for the people that we are losing in Baltimore City every second of every day. And I'm asking you to do it for William Miller Sr. As been mentioned earlier by multiple people on this call, he fought for this. He fought for so many changes. And as was said by Andrew, he stood on his one leg unwavering in his support for harm reduction and for the respect and the dignity of people who use drugs in this city. And so whatever the move is, I don't know what it is. We have informed you. We can give you more information. I don't know what y'all need to do, but I'm asking you to do it and to help us out with this because we are going to do this. We're going to do this. Like, this is going to happen. We just need it to happen sooner rather than later so we can try to save more lives. So thanks, y'all, for being here. Um, thanks for having me and all of us. And I will pass. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I agree. Uh, and and I would just note that uh, our the, the sponsor of this resolution is our going to be our mayor in a matter of weeks. And so I'm really excited about where we go from here uh, in, in the way of um, city leadership uh, embracing this idea. Uh, I think we uh, have a bright future ahead, uh, but a tremendous amount of more work to do um, both at the ground level. Um, and organizing communities around this issue, uh, as well as in uh, City Hall, Annapolis, and DC uh, at removing these um, uh, policies that prohibit us from being able to do the right thing. Um, I, I do see uh, two more uh, with their hands raised. I have, looks like we have Ricky Morris, who I thought spoke earlier. Um, uh, Ricky, are you there? And I know there was some shared, a shared computer, so maybe someone else. Uh, okay. All right, we'll come back. And then Mr. I see- Chair, I don't see any more hand raised. It's like a question mark. Oh, oh. Uh, no, that, oh. that's, no. That's from earlier. Okay, and Evan Serpic. No, just the hand raised, sir. There are okay. no more. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe those are my mistakes. Okay, mm -hmm. right. so there, and there's no call-ins. Um, and so with that, uh, we are going to uh, vote on the resolution. Uh, again, I wanna thank everybody who came uh, and spoke today, shared your lived experiences, shared your advocacy, um, and your expertise on this issue. Uh, I found it incredibly informative. Um, and I'm, uh, again, really excited about where we can go with this moving forward um, in the new year. Um, sorry, I'm trying to also pull up my notes. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, this concludes public testimony. If there's others, I, again, that have further questions, um, there are resources in the chat uh, for anyone that has questions about um, overdose prevention sites, what's been done uh, in North America and across the world, um, please visit those resources. Oh, and uh, I think in the chat, there's also been some offerings of uh, at, uh, made of the advocates to reach out to them directly as well to either support the work that they're doing or answer any questions. Uh, and so I do wanna thank all of them uh, and the Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition and all of your partners um, for pulling this important hearing together, pulling all the experts together um, and sharing very important testimony. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm excited and am in support of this. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will entertain a motion to vote on Council Resolution 20-0189-R. No move. All right, moved by Henry. Is there a second? 
you know, a few of the council members have dropped off. Uh, hold on, give me a second, folks. I'm going to recess for one minute. Okay. One second, be right back. Jump for the vote. Hold on. I'd all second it. Okay. All right. So we have a it's moved by uh, Henry, second by Slifer. Uh, Burnett, I am a yes. Uh, Council Member Henry? Yes. All right. Council Member Clark had to step away, is absent. Um, Council Member Rising also sent me a note saying he had to step away, was in support, but is absent for the vote. Um, uh, Council Member Slifer? Can you, sorry, you can you repeat? I didn't hear. Yes. Yes, okay. All right, uh, so that is three yeses in the affirmative. So the motion passes. Uh, the resolution will be placed on second reader on Monday, December 7th, 2020. The full council will review and take a vote at that time. Again, I wanna thank everyone for attending this hearing. Uh, we are concluded. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon um, and your week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.